It's still a bit of a wet morning, but here we are. Tuesday is nigh, and we're glad to be a part of it. My name is Benjamin Akako. I do this together with Bernice Abubita Lanza. In case you're wondering, in case this is your first time, this is the AM show, and boy, are we glad to have you. Welcome to Tuesday. Well, coming up, as always, I'll be serving you the news shortly, and right after that, We'll be hosting Executive Director of the Media Foundation for West Africa, Suleiman Abraima, is our guest. And then from there, we'll be talking about two salient matters in our big stories. The first one has to do with the election or selection, if you like, by the NDC of former President John Dramani Mahama. Well, he says he's going to operate on a lean government, about 60 ministers. He says it's doable and that these ministers will not receive ex gratia. But how realistic is that? We'll be delving into that all-important issue this morning on the AM show. And then from there, we get into PFJ, planting for food and jobs. Now, this was enacted all the way from 2017 plans and then the rollout. But has it lived up to expectation? This morning, we're going to be hearing from farmers. We're going to be hearing from those major stakeholders who are delivering a verdict on planting for food and jobs. That's what the show looks like this morning. Of course, as always, we'd love to hear from you. So share your thoughts with us and let's know what you think about the conversations we're going to be having this morning on the AM show. On that note, Ghana 4, let's settle for the news up next. Thank you for staying. Time now for the news. And in our first story, children below 18 can no longer be in control of canoes in the Fana community after nine children drowned in a boat accident there last week. This directive by the Great Accra Regional Minister Henry Quarter is one of other measures taken to avert another disaster after it emerged. The person rowing them was under 16 years old. Mr. Quarter led a delegation of government officials and security officials to mourn with family members as they bid farewell to their deceased relatives. It was a somber mood when the Greater Accra Regional Minister Henry Corti arrived in Fana, the fishing community hit by tragedy. Grieving families, leaders and residents had gathered to receive him. Mr. Corti equally pained by the incident, had led a delegation of police officers, NADMO officials and representatives from the Greater Accra Regional Coordinating Council, not only to hear the account of the incident, but to also commiserate with the families. We are here, first of all, to commiserate with you and also to assess the situation for ourselves and then we will also tell you how we intend to go about it. With the consent of the grieving families, a decision to bury the deceased children on Sunday was sealed to respect the ban on drumming and dancing, which starts on Monday. Once the ban on drumming and noise making starts, uh, you are not allowed to bury. And so the Ghana police made it known to us that when situations or tragedies of this nature occurs, the states, being the security agencies, will perform the autopsy and other investigations and they determine whether to release the body or bodies to the families. In this case, the police tells us that they have been able to do that. Now, they asked the parents whether they consent for the children to be given a befitting barrier before Monday and indeed as you heard I mentioned their names one by one I identified their parents and all of them not under duress and I repeat not under duress have willingly 
consented that that should then be buried on Sunday. A canoe and light jackets will be provided for the children to avert another disaster. We have cautioned them that the canoes will not be used for fishing. And again, it cannot be owned by anybody. It is going to be managed by the two assemblies. But the assemblyman will be in charge of the day-to-day -day management of it. Again, going forward, in fact, we'll be bringing them some life jackets. Once we deliver the life jackets to them, the security and intelligence agencies, as part of the directives I've given them, to come up with recommendations. The terms of reference will be the suitability of the area for habitation, the amenities that they need here, because indeed, they are all Ghanaians, and everybody deserves uh, good infrastructure, good amenities to be able to live comfortably in an environment. An ad hoc committee has also been set up to come up with solutions to other concerns of the community and report back in two weeks. For Joy News, Mami AC Nyameche Thompson. Well, from there, former President John Dramani Mahama has uh, reiterated some policies he has asked the Ghanaians to hold him accountable to should he fail to execute if he wins the 2024 elections. Addressing members of the NDC at his post-flag bearership acceptance speech held in Tamale, Mr. Mahama said the next NDC government would restore a stable, inclusive growth of the economy and rejuvenate the banking sector. The post-flag bearership acceptance speech event which was held in Tamale brought together high-profile dignitaries of the NDC across the country. They included former government ministers, members of parliament, chiefs among others. Speaking at the event, the NDC flag bearer John Dramani Mahama said he wants Ghanaians to remember these policies and hold him accountable. I want to reiterate some of the other commitments I made to the people of Ghana on the campaign tour. I want you to remember them so that you can hold me accountable when I come into office. I will keep these promises when I assume office on January 7th, 2025, God willing. We will restore stability and inclusive growth in the economy, and we shall rejuvenate the almost collapsed banks and the financial sector. And this will involve sweeping reforms at the Bank of Ghana because the central bank itself has been a part of creating this problem. I'll create the foundation that will ensure that Ghana will never suffer such a deadly debt management program that threatens to send our elderly people holding government bonds to an early grave and wipe out the investments of the Ghanaian middle class. I'll prioritize local participation in the banking, financial, telecoms, mining, oil and gas, agriculture, manufacturing and construction sectors to generate more jobs for our youth. The Ghanaian young men and women we interact with on a daily basis and their colleagues in other African countries are simply tired of the jobless GDP figures. We will actively attract viable and serious private sector investors to partner government to invest in the productive sectors of this country for more jobs to be created. I will advocate strongly the return of investors who have left because of the poor management of this economy by NDP. This will involve an emphasis on agriculture and agribusiness and will have a strong focus on making Ghanaians own their own micro-enterprises. I'll complete abandoned and ongoing projects instead of rushing to start new ones. We will carry out an inventory of all hospitals, schools, electrification, water and road projects which have stalled or been abandoned and we will make an annual budgetary allocation for their completion. And as I said already, I'll run the leaders but most efficient government under the Fourth Republic 
by appointing not more than 60 ministers and deputy ministers. And I said already, I will work to abolish the payment of ex and cut out waste and ostentation in government. We shall work with Parliament and all stakeholders to complete the constitutional review process and strengthen the separation of powers. Government procurement is recognized as a major source of corruption and misappropriation of public funds. We will therefore, among other measures, set up an independent value for money office to scrutinize all government procurements that are above a $5 million threshold or as shall be recommended by Parliament. I will give anti-corruption state institutions unfettered space to operate. The days of the claim agents must come to an end on January 7, 2025. I will also set up a commission of inquiry to investigate the matter of looted and stolen state lands. will make recommendations for resolving the vexed issue of expropriated guard and lands. Mr. Mahama said they would ensure a speedy investigation into the death of investigative journalist Ahmed Swali. And to give our democracy the fourth estate of the realm, the media must also be given a conducive and collaborative atmosphere to operate as the fourth power that they ought to be without threats, harassment and assassinations. In this regard, we shall speed up the investigation of the assassination of Ahmed Swali. And the perpetrators shall surely be brought to book. He called on all to rally behind the NDC to help the party recapture power to save the country, Ghana. But first, we must win the elections in 2024. And that will require from all of us hard work and winning the trust of the people of Ghana. The NDC and Ghana's interests must therefore continue to guide and bind us all together as one people from one great family. Well, the politics of insults and abuse is preventing women from active participation in politics. This is according to Jean-Marie Formadi, the parliamentary candidate elect for Biakoye constituency, sharing her experiences after beating the incumbent Kwejo Abwaje Nyampong with over 200 votes. She said it took determination to contain some of this abuse to win the election. Jean-Marie was speaking to a T regional correspondent, Peter Sin. Jean Marie Fomadi, also called Lady JM, pulled 490 votes to beat incumbent engineer Kojo Abwaje Nyampon, who obtained 258 votes, a difference of 232 votes. According to her, women are better at managing affairs, hence the reason to entrust more responsibilities into their care. I would have wished that we have more women. Uh, in Parliament because women are doing marvelously well. Uh, it is hard for you to see a woman going into Parliament for only one term and that person is changed. Sometimes two, three, four and unless yeah, and before that person will be changed. So it means they are doing a good job and I believe that um, wherever there are, there are women women are very careful in what they do. She says women representation in frontline politics in the region is not enough. She has, however, attributed the low participation to abuse and insult to women who venture into politics. I'm not in parliament yet, but I, will know, I know I'll get there. That's how I put it that way. Uh, Honorable Adjoint also has been the only female MP in the region. And if you look at, uh, we have eight constituencies in Oti region. We are yet to get a ninth one. But I don't blame we the women. If I tell you what I went through to win this battle, uh, the things that people were saying, 
Okay, some were saying that this constituency cannot be handled by a woman. This constituency cannot be handled by a woman. So they should give it to the men. But that one alone is, I, I don't take that as, uh, but the, the words that I don't want to even repeat, because you are a woman, what someone will say about you because of politics. If you don't take care, you would never do politics as a woman. And then the mentality that if you are a woman and you are going into politics, uh, even if you raise resources, they ask questions about it. Why did she get the money? Why did she get the money? Where are the men getting the money? It's not the, place, it's the same place that women are also getting the money. But they see everything wrong with where a woman is getting money to do politics. But nothing wrong with where a man gets the money to do politics. To break this trend, the professional teacher turned lawyer and entrepreneur says male chauvinists especially must desist from this act. So we we'll plead with the men for them to do clean campaigns. It's not because of politics that you use certain ways to demean women. As they are doing that, I don't take it as they demeaning me, but demeaning women because it could be someone else. So I'll plead with them that politics shouldn't be dirty. Peter Sanu for Joy News. Now, the co-chairperson of the National Action Plan Steering Committee, Marinate, says Ghana needs a concrete plan to fight corruption. Speaking at the opening of a two-day workshop in Wa, she noted that her committee was collating views from across all 16 regions to deepen democracy and also ensure ownership of the National Action Plan. Here's a report by Rafiq Salam. As part of the process of developing a National Action Plan, on business and human rights in order to implement the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights in the country. A two-day stakeholder workshop was held in WA, bringing all key actors in the industry to make inputs in the NAP. The Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, Shiraj, in collaboration with the Attorney General and Ministry of Justice with support from Action Aid Ghana, engaged the stakeholders to deliberate and collect inputs into the NAP. Our power Regional Director of Chirag, Lawyer Obedi Bin Siddiq, who spoke on behalf of the Director General of Chirag, says the ball rolling with the main objective of the workshop. I think here yeah, it is give and take. They are going to feed you, but at the same time, you also produce. The last one, the first two is for your consumption. That is to sensitize you on fundamental human rights and then to present the, uh, to you a follow you of the draft plan. But then you also give your input. I think for me, that is the focus of this program. We need your input into the plan. Director in charge of human rights, Ashraq, and co-chairperson of the NAP steering committee, Mayor Ajelenate, stated that a resilient NAP requires an inclusive approach for a sustainable implementation Hence the need to organize the workshop. A resilient NAP requires inclusive approach for a sustainable implementation. And that is why we are here as a steering committee in charge of developing the National Action Plan. We are engaging state actors and non-state actors <coughs> across the 16 regions to solicit inputs into the development of the plan as a way to deepen democracy and to take cognizance of peculiarities that exist across the various regions to ensure ownership of the plan when completed for implementation. Project manager of Action Aid Ghana, Samuel Saboli, who spoke on behalf of his country director, noted the harrowing stories of victims whose rights have been violated. On a daily basis, we hear or read about the harrowing stories of employees, consumers, and community members who fall victims of actions of businesses that violate their rights as human. These right abuses, these right abuse actions sometimes lead to environmental pollution, underpaying of workers, or forcefully, forcefully evicting communities and depriving them of their livelihoods. 
the participants were given opportunity to share and ask questions relating to the NAP. And I want to link it to our senior citizens who have been struggling all the while to claim their rights. Are there bodies in our system who can also delve into the matters and give them some support? Because at a point, I believe some of them are defenseless, but they have no support. But they have a right. What do you do about it, please? And over time, we all anticipate that there are new areas where we have to accommodate other people that are not necessarily like us. So in terms of LGBTQ+, plus, all of us know that we are obstinate against it, but we are also smart enough to appreciate that it is coming. General Secretary of the General Agricultural Workers Union of TUC and a member of the Serum Committee of NAP, Edward Caraway, and Director of Human Rights, Ashraf Merinati, in the end, were impressed with the response of the participants. Sometimes we sit somewhere and we think that human rights must be generic. Yes, it is, there are some generic human rights issues, but there are local human rights issues that pertain to you know, the environment and the place that they come from. So it is so insi uh, insightful that uh, uh, we have had opportunity you know, to understand some of the challenges that workers within the uh, Upper West region are uh, uh, facing. And for me, beyond even the National Action Plan, is what I understand and what I can apply you know, as a, a union leader to advocate either with companies, with government, to uh, indeed enhance the respect for human rights of workers. It's been very participatory. We've gotten to know that there are issues about even galamse pollution of the environment, issues about land ownership, which is affecting people's livelihoods, among others. A similar workshop was held for non-stake actors, especially those in the business sector. Reporting for Dre News, Rafik Salam. Wa. Thank you for staying. That's how we cap off the news. Up next, the news review with Suleiman Abraima, Executive Director, Media Foundation for West Africa. Do stay. Hi there, thank you for staying for the news review. It's another beautiful morning. Right before we get into it, this review is brought to you by Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic. They are offering you free prostate screening, free female fertility screening as well. You can locate them here in Accra at Spintex opposite the Shell signboard. Then Kumasi Kronomabwe here behind the Angel Educational Complex. There is Takrade Anaji State, Tema Community 22, Techiman Hanswa and Esiama. In Zima. If you'd like to call them, these are the numbers to call 0244 867 068 or 0274 234 321. Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic, the end to chronic disease. Now, for the newspaper review this morning, we're joined by Suleiman Abraima, he's Executive Director, Media Foundation for West Africa. A very good morning to you, Suley. Good morning, Ben. Mr. Abraima, it's been a while. How have you Indeed. been in between? <coughs> well, <coughs> and, uh, and coping. Awesome. Awesome. Like I usually do, it's a lean morning by way of the newspapers, uh, just a fraction of the ones we'd usually have this morning. But I'd like us to kick start the conversation from the standpoint of some of the recent happenings. So there is that drowning incident, unfortunate incident in Fana in the Ga East municipality, where nine children lost their lives. They've been buried this morning in the news. We were talking about the Great Accra Regional Minister going there. Some have asked why 
other ministers. Certain ministers were not there, but he was there. And now the directive is that young people, people below a certain age, should not row these canoes. That was what happened in this instance. It was a young person who may not have had that much experience. You can tag that to the incident in January in Wyokope where eight died. So eight plus nine, you get 17 in the space of just about five months. I was speaking to someone earlier uh, this morning and the person said to me, you know what? It, it, it doesn't take much. They'll talk about it. But this, God forbid, likely will happen again because the structures are simply not in place and because our leaders do not care. Is that the same? Is that a sentiment you share? And how do you feel about that FANA development? Well, uh, let me start by saying that it's a very <clears throat> important incident and condolences to the family. It must be a very, very painful experience to lose kids at that age and in that numbers. Now, I believe that it comes down to the whole question about collectively as a society taking responsibility and doing the right things. Yes, it is important that we ensure that authorities that are supposed to enforce our laws do so. But the reality is that sometimes the law enforcement agencies cannot be everywhere. The persons who are required to um, sort of command authority in ensuring that certain things do not happen would not be everywhere at all the time. And so we as you know, citizens, as parents, as leaders in our society in various roles also do have a responsibility in ensuring that certain basic rules are adhered to, certain basic principles are adhered to. I don't think that we should get to a point where we say, we need a police officer to be present, we need a minister or the DCE to be present in order not to allow for the wrong things, I mean, not to allow the wrong things to happen, such as, you know, having kids, um, you know, take on the boats and then get themselves onto the water. So it's unfortunate, but these things should get all of us thinking. How do we collectively assume the responsibility of ensuring that society functions in a way that is orderly, that is disciplined, and ensure that we avoid some of these uh, very, very, very fatal and uh, tragic uh, fatalities? I think we all have a responsibility to talk to each other, to preach to each other, to advise each other in ensuring that we all do the little that we can, even as we have duty bearers and law enforcement agencies to do what they have to do, we also have to play our role. Otherwise, I think some of these things would continue to happen. Just uh, before we get into the papers as well, there is the NDC's uh, primaries, parliamentary and presidential, of course, you know by now, uh, most definitely that the former president secured 98.9% of the votes cast. Dr. Dufour withdrew. Still, some people voted, uh, sent him a few votes. Kojo Bonsu had 1.1%, and that was how the cookie crumbled. But on the back of that, the former president has been saying, again, something from our news this morning, that he will have a ministerial set of no more than 60, including deputy ministers, and that there will be no excretia for them. What do you make of that? Well, um, certainly I think that we are in a country where even 60 is too, too large a number. But if you have a government that has gone past 100, then it makes the 60 um, something that looks quite fanciful, something that looks quite great. Um, it, would be, it would be a great start um, if 60 becomes the target and indeed what the practice becomes. Uh, I'm sure there would be other governments in the future who would promise that, look, we can do it with 40. And I believe that indeed, as a country, we can run this country with less than 40 ministers. But again, as I, as I said, once the threshold has been moved above 100, at some point 110 or more, it makes um, the 60 quite um, 
um, a decent a decent number to look at. The question of Esbrasia, I think it is a very, very immoral practice uh, that has persisted over the period. And I wonder did, why... Did, did you just say you thought it was a very immoral practice? No, it is. It, it has always been an immoral practice. Mm -hmm. And I believe that there are people who should begin to be asking themselves and, and questioning their conscience why over the years they've, they've been uh, uh, the beneficiaries of multiple ex gracias in a country where, you know, several people are struggling to survive, in a country where, as I always would mention, we still have kids lying on their bellies to study, as was revealed in your recent documentary on Ghana Schools of Shame. In a country where mothers are dying during delivery and infants are dying from mosquito bites and so on. Why would we have, for example, a council of state that is supposed to be advising the president? Persons that I believe are, are there because they've been they are an, they are accomplished uh, set of people, people who certainly have lived lives that are worthy of emulation and have been brought together to advise the president. And what they do is, first of all, take car loans, car loans that have, I mean, uh, for me, in my view, it's actually not a loan. Because if you are taking a car loan that the interest is being paid by the state and about 70 or 60 percent of even the actual amount is also being paid by the state. What kind of loan is that? And then you sell for four years and sometimes, and it's even part time because some of them are actually working, it's part time. And then at the end of four years, you take, you know, ex gratia from the state, including persons who have retired on salary, like, like, like the, the former chief justice, like the former CDS. These are people who have retired on salary, taking their end of service benefit, and yet are, you know, being paid every month, just as Supreme Court judge, justices are being paid. And then, at the end, and then, of course, they receive allowances as, you know, um, um, Council of State members. And I'm talking about allowances in court because it is not, I mean, a thousand cities or 2,000 cities. And then, at the end of four years, you collect, you know, 400, 500,000 as S. Gratia. And if you are on again, at the end of another four years, you do the same thing. And this applies to parliamentarians and, and all the other Article 71 appointees. I think that it has been an immoral practice and persons who have benefited from it continuously should really question their conscience whether indeed they have acted as patriots to this country. So I think it's a great thing if the former president says, look, if I get power, I'm going to scrap that particular practice. It is something that ought not to have been in existence in the first place. And in my view, it's one of the things that shows how greedy our leaders are and how greedy perhaps those who formulated the constitution uh, thought they ought to have been. So, well, it's, it's a positive thing if he happens to get the power and will do it indeed. Mm. That's an interesting take you have there on this matter of ex gratia. Uh, some also feel, why should others benefit for us not to uh, benefit. But some have said that, look, you can do without this. It, I mean, in other jurisdictions, they have their own systems, but that we are going over the top, especially considering our economic situation as a country. But let's get into the Daily Guide. There's more talk about money there. IMF cash hits Bank of Ghana this week. The projections are that from tomorrow onwards, we should be getting that money the first tranche of about $600 million. OSP chases money-throwing NDC MP aspirant, and I'll be delving into related issues there with you. Prepare your handing over notes, Mahama, to NPP. And uh, Hajia for real, extradited to US in $2 million romance scam. That has also been trending. Amanasi chief begs Ochehene, uh, that story there as well. On the back page, it feels like there is no hope. Uh, it has to do with Arsenal and their title race. In fact, also there, Partey's form dipped at a crucial time. And uh, that, those are the comments of Manchester United legend and Sky Sports pundit Gary Neville, who has blamed Arsenal's title woes on the drop in performance of midfielder Thomas Partey, our very own party. Players resist LGBTQ plus gesture. What's the story there? Several Toulouse players were withdrawn from the squad for Sunday's League 1 uh, 
draw against Nantes after they refused to have their names associated with a league-wide gesture of support for the LGBTQ plus community, the club said. And then there's HD plus pledges support for Homo Marathon. That's just in sports. Later, you can share your thoughts on the players resisting LGBTQ plus gesture and uh, whether Thomas Partey, in the end, was the undoing of his team, Arsenal. But let's start from the start. <clears throat> Minister of State at the Finance Ministry, Dr. Mohamed Amin Adam Anta, has stated that the International Monetary Fund is likely to transfer the first tranche of $600 million to Ghana immediately after the executive board approves the country's request for an extended credit facility. According to him, the second tranche of the same amount will be released before the end of the year, with the remainder disbursed in equal tranches of $360 million after a semi-annual review. Quoting him, he says, we expect a deal on Wednesday. Dr. Anta is quoted to have told uh, Reuters, adding, with the disbursement, there is going to be $600 million as a first tranche just immediately after the approval. That is it. And let me just tie in the money-related story so you can rely actually link both of them. <clears throat> so on the OSP chasing money-throwing NDC MP aspirants. And I think Domiabra Obum, we saw a certain AI there with a car parked full of rice that he was sharing. So you go and vote. I don't know how he was getting his proof, his checks, but you go and vote and then you come and pick up uh, your rice. In, in, but in this incident, the office of the special prosecutor summoned Juliana Kinangwasan, a defeated NDC parliamentary aspirant, for a draft such a Dumasi over a suspected instance of corruption against her. Juliana, who placed fourth in the parliamentary primary after garnering 216 votes, threw money on delegates at the Ahmadiyya School Park during the polls as a way of voter inducement. Just to cut a long story short, she did this twice and she claimed she found money in her car and started sharing the money. Who put the money there? I guess she would be the best person to tell us. Um, money in our politics. What do you make of these developments, Suleimana? Well, um, first of all, the uh, um, deal, um, sometimes I, I feel um, that as Ghanaians, we have dug ourselves into a pit that, you know, um, really makes us look quite... Um, um, I mean, it's a, it's a, for me, it's an embarrassing development that a country like Ghana, uh, right now, have gotten ourselves into a situation where governments would want us to applaud them on whether or not they are getting the IMF deal um, uh, within a certain period of time. And yesterday, when I read about this $600 million as first tranche, I was asking myself, really, is it, what would $600 million do to our, our economy? I think that we've had far more. In, in COVID, we got more money in than $600 million. And, and yet, how transformed did we get our economy? Uh, and so, well, that's where we are, where anything matters. Um, but I would prefer that the government perhaps um, <laughs> shuts its mouth. And then the next time they are talking to Ghanaians, they will say, well, the IMF money is here. Because when this whole enterprise started, we were told, oh, we'll get it in three months. Then it was, oh, in six months. Oh, it was, by the end of the year, the IMF deal would have been sealed. Oh, now we are looking at the first, by the end of the first quarter of 2023. And first quarter came to pass, and now we are being told, oh, by next week, the money will hit our accounts. Well, maybe it's a way of managing um, people's um, anxiety, ways of um, trying to show up the city's value so that people don't lose confidence and all of that. But if it is, I think that it is getting quite too much. And what is important is not about when and how much is hitting our accounts. It's about how much, I mean, how we are managing the economy going forward. Um, I read yesterday where I think it was the same, my good friend, <clears throat> Dr. Amin Anta, uh, being said to have said that once the IMF deal is approved, Ghana can go to the capital market again. And I was like, saying, what? <coughs> well, Ghana can go back to the capital market to continue to borrow. 
Is that what we want to do? So it's a sad development, but I'm just hoping that collectively as Ghanaians, we would do perhaps more than we have done to keep our government um, in check and to get our government to act in a more responsible way. Um, money in the politics, money in our politics. And, and, and just to add to the money in the politics, all these people who used some form of inducement lost miserably. And tied to that, the former president uh, made some pledges to some people. TNT, transportation of 40 Ghana cities. In one constituency, they agitated that. If they didn't get the 40 Ghana CDs, uh, they wouldn't go ahead to vote. I hear that is also something that is on the OSP's uh, radar, or some people are proffering that that too should be on the OSP's radar. What's your thinking on that, in addition to uh, Juliana's issue? Well, I think that, I think that uh, on these issues, we are perhaps acting quite um, hypocritically. We know that one of the tragedies of our politics is the excessive use of money. When you say that all those who used some sort of inducements lost, that may not be the reality. In fact, it is all those whose acts of inducements were open and witnessed, perhaps are those that we will say lost. I don't think that any of the con contestants can, can come out and say, that they did not use money. In fact, <laughs> those, those whose actions we did not witness perhaps are the ones who even paid more. And if you knew anyone who was contesting, you would have heard the lamentations about how much is going into this you know, business of trying to contest, both incumbents and those who were trying to unseat incumbents. The money in our politics is perhaps the major driver of the, corrupt, the, the monumental corruption that we are witnessing in our society. Whether it is presidential race that is ongoing in the MPP or the one that has just concluded in the NDC, significant amounts of monies would have been used, even including that of President Mahama, for me, which was a no contest. Even that, I'm sure a lot of monies would have been into. The most important thing for the OSP to do perhaps is to take steps to uh, see in what ways can we compel people to disclose where they are getting their monies from and in what ways can we make political party financing more transparent. But yes, it is important to invite uh, this lady who may be, who, who was seen uh, splashing cash, cash out there. When I saw it and people were complaining, I said, okay, so if this was, let's say, five CD notes, then she takes a bundle, and then throws it in the air. You see 100 notes flying all over. She takes another one, does the same thing, and then um, maybe 10 times. That's, that's 5,000, essentially. But people are spending hundreds of thousands in, in, in different ways that may not have been observed. But, but, but does, it, does it make it right? We're talking about the monetization of our politics and where that is leading us, the precipice. That doesn't make it right. Or is it because everybody is doing it? So uh, if we condemn, if someone comes to the fore and we condemn that person, we're wrong. No, absolutely. It doesn't make it right. But the point I'm making is that we would not go anywhere if all we are doing is to look out for those whose actions we can see when others are doing it and we know they are doing it. I don't think that the OSP, uh, my friend Kizia Dabin doesn't know that all these candidates were paying people. I mean, we all know. And, and, and you talk to people and they will tell you how much they received. There were people who were receiving 500 CDs per candidate. I mean, from, from one candidate, 200 CDs. Somebody will pay 500, this person will come and pay 600, this person will come and pay 300, and so on. The question is, at the end of the day, how are these people expecting to recover all these huge expenses? And of course, what it means is that they get to parliament and they have to make you know, they, are, they have to make that money back. And in fact, they have to even make, make it more. You can't also blame those who are demanding because our politics today is said that what happened is a contest about who is going to get elected to make money. It's not about who is going to get elected to serve the interests of the public 
to make you know the laws that are in the, the you know public interest and so on is essentially about a competition to make money a competition to get power a competition to have privilege and that is why we are in a system where people will never resign no matter what they won't resign because they are in there for power for money and for privilege in other jurisdictions where people see the opportunity to serve as you know um, a calling they would they would immediately you know hand over and i mean move on because they are in there to serve the interests of the people and not to make money in our case it is different the point i am making is that the monetization of politics is not the right thing but it would be you know quite hypocritical for us to pretend that oh others didn't do it and those who did it are the ones who splashed money in the air we need to approach it with a very comprehensive strategy you know, and adopt practices elsewhere where people have to disclose their source of finance. Otherwise, it is, it is criminal. So I'm saying that the woman who was seen doing that is perhaps the micro... He, maybe she didn't even have enough money to pay what people were paying and she wanted just to show it publicly. I'm not saying it is right, but everyone else did it. Mm. And so as a country, we need to approach this with a lot of seriousness rather than you know, pick and choose based on what we see. Let's pick two more stories from the Daily Guide newspaper very quickly and call it a wrap for that paper. Prepare your handing over notes, Mahama, to MPP. And former President John Dramani Mahama sent a message to the new Patriotic Party to start preparing its handing over notes to leave office after the 2024 general election. According to him, Ghanaians have witnessed the incompetence of the governing MPP and are waiting to vote massively for the NDC come 2024 to rescue the country. He indicated that the Okufuado baumian led administration had mismanaged the country, which had resulted in the bad economy the country was currently facing, and assured that the NDC would rebuild the economy and bring back licenses of banks which were wrongfully cancelled. Then he talks about the 60 ministers, uh, deputy ministers and other appointees. I'll, I'll quickly come to you uh, for your take on that right after this one. Galamse Pitt swallows seven, uh, 17 others missing. And we know of that recent incident in the Brim North District. But the one I want to focus on, Ghanaian social media influencer, Hadia for real, real name Mona Faiz Montrage, has been extradited from the UK to the US for her alleged involvement in a $2 million romance scam. Federal prosecutors say the socialite cum musician allegedly defrauded elderly single American men and women out of over $2 million in a depraved Lonely Hearts scam. Reports indicate that Hadja Farrell appeared in a federal court in Manhattan yesterday for her alleged involvement in several romance scams. Any reactions to these, especially as young people nowadays look to many different ways to make ends meet, but some of those ways may not necessarily be proper. What's your take? Well, um, what I would say is, well, if the, 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 the developments um, on this, um, I mean, Norma being extradited to the U.S., is some you know alleged acts of criminality and indeed if it happened then of course um, it is right that she's made to face justice and um, the victims as we are being told are mainly citizens of the united states and um, once there is that um, agreement between the uk and the us uh, for persons who may have committed an offense to be extradited uh, i would say yes i mean it should happen we should wait and see what the how the justice delivery system would go and what the conclusion would be but as you've said it's important that we keep uh, highlighting the, the the point that money is not everything um even if you have all the money in the world that shouldn't i mean it's important yes it's important to have money but not to have money through cruel means through fraudulent means um and and through you know Practices that would end up putting you uh, into trouble. It's unfortunate, but it should be a lesson for all of us, even though 
yes, trial is still ongoing and we don't know how it will end. But in our country, we talk about those who are engaged in the Sakawa practice and, you know, um, people will tell you how many cars somebody is driving, how many houses somebody has as a result of certain activities that they are engaged in. I think that shouldn't be the motivation. Let's, let's work hard. Let's do the right things. And I'm sure if we work hard, we are disciplined, we are honest, we can at least have what would make us comfortable. Um, so that, that would be my message to um, colleagues and, and young folks in, in our country. Um, the other sad incident about the collapse of the Galamse pit that has resulted in the death of a number of people, very unfortunate. Again, it points to the whole failure in dealing with the Galamse menace. And as I said, it's a very complex development because people are struggling to make ends meet. And yet we have um, a system that is not working for, for many people, working just for a few. Uh, as a result of governance failures, failure over the years. And that then leads me to President Mohammed's um, comment about asking the MPP to prepare his handing over notes. I think whatever, whatever the um, outcome, the current MPP administration would indeed prepare handing over notes. But whether that notes will be getting back to um, another MPP-led president or an NDC president is something that we all do not know. Um, there, is no, there is no doubt that this government has really been a disappointment in terms of the expectations that we all had. COVID, Russia, Ukraine, da, 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 all those are alibis. I think that the government has indeed uh, failed in many ways. But that is not to also say that the Mahama administration was a fantastic administration. I think that it also had its own failures. And over the years, if we had had governments that truly and honestly deliver on behalf of the people, I think Ghana would have been a significantly better place than we are now. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we are living in a mess as a result of mismanagement, as a result of the failure mm -hmm. of this government, but it shouldn't get us to be complacent and say, well, maybe having the NDC back is the ultimate solution. We need to build that momentum that will hold any government in power accountable and responsible to the people. Other than that, the NDC comes to power and it is the same story. Ministers would enrich themselves, appointees would enrich themselves. And we know NDC ministers who have made it, bought several houses, bought houses in, in the US, in the UK, and so on and so forth. Where did they get those monies from? It's the same practice of corruption. So, um, as many would say, we are in, in a fix, you know, in, in our country. People would have thought that, oh, President Kufuado will be a fantastic leader. He's come and he's been a disappointment. Um, people were disappointed with President Mahama and his leadership. Right now, we are between, as they say, the devil and the deep blue sea. And we, we don't really know uh, where to go. But mm. whatever, democracy remains our best choice and we must continue. Let's wrap the conversation with these stories. Uh, the Finder and the Chronicle newspaper, starting with the Finder. Transport fares reduced by 10% effective tomorrow. That story is on page five. Ghana lacks processing capacity to soon ban raw minerals export. That is on page four. And government owes us over 16 billion Ghana cities. Road and building contractors cry out. We don't even need to get the details of this. We already know. So despite paying 10 billion Ghana cities to contra contractors in four years, so over four years, 10 billion Ghana cities has been paid, government still owes at them, according to the group, over 16 billion Ghana cities. And that is the road and building contractors crying out. On page five, let's take a quick look at that story. So transport fares for commercial vehicles plying the roads in the country are set to reduce by 10% on Wednesday. The move follows the recent downward trend of petroleum prices. Uh, there's also this one in the Chronicle, a victory speech pledge. Mahama to return Unibank to do four. Of course, he may not have said directly that uh, just Unibank, but he said broadly that those that had been affected by the banking sector cleanup uh, through some illicit means, so to speak, or unfairly would have that returned. Uh, what is your take on this as we wrap? We have just about two minutes. 
Well, um, rightly said, Mahama may have not said that I will return a Unibank to the fore, but made a, a general comment. I think that's quite a diabolic um, headline on the part of um, the... Which is the why I situated it in context, in its proper context, very quickly. <laughs> uh, and, and so I, I think it's a, it's a big conversation. I am not a finance person, but I think that that whole, um, whole scale a full-scale uh, collapse of those, you know, several banks was a very, very um, terrible decision by this government. The government had the 21 billion or so that it claims it used to <clears throat> um, um, uh, pay compensations and, and, and do the restructuring. I think that a lot of those banks could have been saved. Okay. And the jobs that were lost could have been, could have been saved. So for me, it was had a terrible decision. If there were a few banks that were that were certainly banks that ought to go, yes, they could have gone. But from analysts and all of that, you hear that a number of banks were quite resilient and could have been um, supported in one way or the other to keep their employees and to keep the banking sector um, going without necessarily having to spend the so-called 21 billion that was spent on the banking sector um, cleanup exercise. Right. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, it would be worthwhile to look into uh, what went into the banking sector cleanup. And finally, I think one of the things that President Mahama said that I read yesterday was the fact that if he happens to get power, he would uh, take the Ahmed Swale uh, investigations quite seriously. I think that is a very, very welcoming um, development. Hopefully, it will get even this government to want to do the right thing because, as they say, impunity begets impunity. And as we know, uh, press freedom in our country over the last four or five years under the Kufuado regime right. has not been. Did, did, did my ride just cut you off? <laughs> I, I, I actually fully made my submission. Okay. Uh, All right. I was just hoping I had not, I had not cut you off. Sulevana, we're grateful that you've joined us this morning. As always, we want to see you more. It's been a while and we wish you the best of the day, sir. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Suleiman Abraham, Executive Director, Media Foundation for West Africa. Of course, this segment brought to you by Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic. They're offering free prostate screening, free fertility screening as well. You can locate them here in Accra, Spintex opposite the Shell signboard, Kumasi Kronomabwe here, behind the Angel Educational Complex, Takrade Anaji State Tema Community 22, Techiman Hansu and Esiama and Enzima. You can uh, also call them on 244 8670680274234321 or Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic the end to chronic disease a very happy birthday well belated uh, happy birthday to Rita Edem Dugby very good friend of mine Rita forgive me I actually didn't see uh, yesterday but belated happy birthday to you and we wish you the best of God's blessings on that note let's settle for what's coming in sports Now on the AIM show with me, Muftaru Nabila Abdullah, and we start from the office of the Ministry of Youth and Sports, where Mustafa Yusuf is a head of that institution. Over the weekend, he toured the Aliu Muhammad Sports Stadium in Somali, and he realized that power was disconnected to the facility due to a debt owed the electricity company of Ghana. He's promised that his office would ensure that power is connected back to the facility to enhance the development of football in the area. There's more in the following report. The electricity, a company of Ghana, disconnected power to the Aliu Mahama Sports Stadium following a debt that was about 500,000 Ghana cities. The Minister of Youth and Sports, Mustafa Yusuf, revealed that his outfit is committed to settling the debt. However, he believes the current generator available should be able to provide power to the facility. Yes, it's, it has come to my attention and that is why we are here to inspect the facility. But we also know that we have our own uh, genset here.
but I will engage uh, the National Sports Authority to see what we can do to bring back the, the, the light to the facility. The SAFE also reiterated the commitment of the Ministry of Youth and Sports to complete the Yende Youth Resource Center, a facility that has been left abandoned since 2020. I visited there, I was with the president and we visited that facility. Uh, the first phase, I'm, uh, I'm told, is completed and the, the contractor, the second phase contractor has been prepared to come and go on. So work is going to be completed on the Yende uh, Youth Resource Center and the Yudai Youth Resource Center is a, a part of the 10 youth resource centers that we are doing. Currently, when you go to Kofodia, uh, Adaklu, you go to Azim, you go to Dunkwa Ofen, all these facilities are being worked on. And why? So once these first phase, five of them, the second phases are done, the next five second phase will also be uh, worked on and they will be put into good use. Mustafa Youssef, Director General of the National Sports Authority, Professor Peter Chumesi, his deputy, Bao Majid, toured the Aliou Mahama Sports Stadium to ascertain the level of deterioration of the facility and promised renovation work would start soon. Let's go to Kumasi Asante Kotoko, their former striker, Eric Beckwin, says that it is important the leadership of the club uh, keeps Melania Amponsa as the chief executive officer of the porcupine warriors according to him continuity would help him build a better team that will compete for loris at the continental level being uh, a straight ladder or i mean something that is going up they keep going up down up down which doesn't speak well of the club because kotoko during our time we even won the league around first round yeah yeah so that tells you the capacity that the team has the expectations that they have but this is in, I would say we need to put things in order and then do the right thing as soon as possible if really we want to go higher and go to Africa and claim glory because the likes of Egypt, uh, Alali, Zamale, they are all pushing uh, so well, Casablanca, putting money, uh, areas Bekani, yeah, putting uh, money and all that. Then you, 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 you and I know the money that are going in here and then we are not having the quality. In. Now we have the quantity, but the quality is few. Yeah, they are all good players, but they need certain one or two to be injected into them to become the top players and let them know the club that they are playing. And we are good to You're not a politician, but I'm going to ask you a political <laughs> question. Yes, I'm going to ask you a very, very, very political question. Okay. Nanaya Mponsa, his tenure is coming to an end. Mm -hmm. Would you suggest that they extend his mandate at Kotoko? Yeah, in, in, in one point, I would say yes because of continuity, because of the vision that... And you see, this thing, as, um, it's good you started with political, because even in our, our entire nation, that yeah. is what is happening. Whereby somebody will put blog, the person, the other one can come and move the blog, <laughs> re-put the same blog again, then we stay at the same level. Yeah. But instead of doing the continuity, yeah. we don't do it, and then we keep breaking, placing, breaking, placing, and then we'll keep... Because you see, when you are building, and the foundation is not right. You don't see the problem from the ground. You see the cracks. Let's go. Let's continue. You but has it done well? Do you think that Yamponza has done well? Yes. With so the three years mandate that was given to him. Yeah, per, per his vision that he came with. I would say he, he, he has done his part. And as for uh, Kotoko and House of Folk, you can't do all. You can only come and do your quota and go. But within the quota, I mean, your exploit is what is more important. So I think Nana have done good so far. If we can maintain him for continuity, I think it will be best for the club. That game is tonight. It is a semi-final uh, contest between Inter Milan and AC Milan, the second leg. And the Joy Sports Pop Series is taking you to Medina uh, Bayview, where we'll be watching that game. So do join the Joy Sports team uh, in Medina as we watch the game together and bring you live commentary of the, the contest. Don't forget to be there. We appreciate your company for joining us for the AM Sports with me, Muftar and Nabila Abla. You can head on to myjoyonline.com and read some more sports stories.
fact, some Ghanaians in the diaspora have proven to be extremely beneficial to our country. Take, for instance, Professor Frimpo Mboateng of the Cardiothoracic Center, fame, who returned from Germany to establish the Cardio Center and has saved many Ghanaian lives. Since the professor's return, he has contributed his significant bits in medicine and in politics. And only recently, an Al Jazeera documentary accusing President Akufuado and his government of organized crime in collusion with a foreigner. It also emerged that the heart surgeon had two years ago boldly exposed the duplicity of the MPP government in the fight against Galamsey. His report has opened a can of worms, which I know this president, in his usual manner, will sweep under the carpet, just as many corruption scandals have been cleared by who is called the clearing agent. We shall pursue this matter further and make sure that justice is done. The truth is that this government cannot just wish away the reality that Ghana is not looking good on the Corruption per Perception Index of Trans Transparency International. The President no longer makes corruption a pet topic in any of his speeches because corruption has defeated him hands down. And let me assure you, as I stated in Garu in the Upper East during my campaign tour, that I will adopt a robust root and branch approach to fighting corruption. Because corruption is a major source through which state resources are lost. It will not matter whether the people involved in the corruption are our own people or from some other party. We will continue the constitution review process commenced by President John Evans Atamils of blessed memory. We will carry it to its logical conclusion. The post flag bearership acceptance speech event, which was held in Tamale, brought together high profile dignitaries of the NDC across the country. Welcome back on uh, the AM show. We get into our first big story as we look at the dynamics following, well, the victory of uh, John Dramani Mahama and uh, the matters arising. He's been saying a lot in that post victory speech on his number of ministers, on uh, ex gratia, on the banking sector, among others. But this morning, as we get our guests on board, we're going to have a conversation on John Dramani Mohammed's candidature for the NDC. What does he bring to the table? And uh, should the NPP be worried, for example? Well, joining the conversation this morning, Musa Dankwai is Executive Director, Global Info Analytics. He joins us in the studio. We also have Dr. Tutu Wain. He is a political marketing consultant at the University of Education, Winneba. Joining us virtually, Joyce Bauer Mokhtari, a special aide to John Dramani Mahama, and Richard Ahiangba is Director of Communications with the NPP. All of them join the conversation this uh, morning. I'll start with those uh, joining the, the conversation virtually. Well, gentlemen in the studio, a very good morning to you. Good morning. And to those of you virtually, let me cross-check. Uh, Madam Mokhtari, Joyce Bauer Mokhtari, can you hear me? I can hear you. Good morning. Good to have you. Richard, can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. All right. So we'll start with Joyce uh, Bauer Mokhtari. Saturday was D-Day. And uh, former President John Dramani Mahama swept the votes, 98.9% of the votes cast. In the aftermath, we've heard a number of pronouncements by the former president. But let's start from what this means to your party, the NDC, to have re-elected John Dramani Mahama to be your party's flag bearer for the 2024 elections. What does it mean to the NDC? Well, thank you very much and a very good morning to all of you and good morning to the good people of Ghana. You know, I think that this is a profound, a resounding and a huge statement for and by the NDC that John Gamani Mahama has been elected overwhelmingly across the country as the flag bearer going into the 2024 election. It means, therefore, that the party and all of us I add it then, that this is the man with the requisite experience, with the vision, with the character, with the qualities, the sort of individual that we expect to lead us 
going into the 2024 election. That for us, who was in his office as a staff, we didn't have any surprises there. We had no doubts either because we were convinced that John Gamani Mahama stood tall in the contest to win overwhelmingly to lead us into the next election. And we thank the good Lord that that is exactly what happened. Going forward, Mr. Mahama is rolling up his sleeves immediately. He knows that this is going to be a very long uh, election campaign. He knows there's going to be enormous work to be done. Of course, we now have a sort of a very cynical uh, electorate. The voting public will no longer just swallow promises to line and sinker. The voter public now expects more from persons who put themselves up to lead this country going forward. And I love the fact that each time we have gone on the campaign trail, each and everything that John Damani Mahama has said or put forward in terms of his policy alternatives have been put to stick to. Many questions have come up, many conversations have come up, and I do expect that going forward, the speech yesterday will generate similar conversation right up to the point where we would have to put these up to the general public to vote resoundingly for him once more to leave this country in 2024. Thank you for those initial comments. Let me come to you, Richard Ahiangba. Uh, how did you receive the election? Some say it was no surprise, but that overwhelming, um, should you say, mandate given by the NDC to John Dramani Mahama, it has not happened before in that party, such a mandate. Uh, did it send any shivers down the spine of the NPP? Thank you, Benjamin, and uh, good morning to your listeners and to all my co-panelists. Um, um, well, uh, the former president, um, Big K, uh, is, is no surprise at all. If anybody is, um, then that person needs to be woken up. Uh, it's been long coming, um, and everybody expected it that he was going to win. I've listened to uh, my sister Joyce on several occasions. Uh, assume that he is the presumptive leader uh, in waiting of the NDC. The processes were just going to crown it, but it has been a known secret for a very long time. Um, so that there is no surprise there. Um, but also, uh, I was surprised, most especially by yesterday's presentation by the former president. Uh, I think he looked very well, probably. Uh, appearing and uh, representing our culture, uh, that's good. But beyond that, uh, everything the former president said, uh, I was sitting by my phone watching because I was far out of Accra and watching on my phone and I was cringing to say what exactly is the former president saying and why does he think that we don't know him or his record. Everything he said yesterday in my view, were simply words that he was saying. He didn't simply convince anyone. Uh, it's not convincing because his track record is always being measured against what he's saying going into the future. Uh, he's had ample time to have demonstrated the, the things he was saying, but simply failed to do any in ways that he's trying to portray that he's capable of doing. At any rate, listening to former President Mahama yesterday, I was asking myself, at what point now uh, has anything changed to say that now he can use four years to transform this country when he earlier on said that it was impossible to do so. So I wasn't surprised, but I was shocked. I wasn't surprised in the sense uh, that his victory was uh, anything uh, unknown, but I was surprised what he's saying. What I thought he may have said is to admit the, the failures of the past, which is not a bad thing to do, to have admitted that, yes, we had a chance before and we blew it. But now we have learned and we have behind us that experience and we are going to change our ways and do things in these manners or in this manner going forward. One, two, three, four, five are the changes that we, we have experienced, and these are the things we're going to do different. 
until and unless that is said, that admission comes in, everything the former president said yesterday cannot be trusted. Nobody uh, will be able to hang their hat on it because if you measure his performance in the past and what he's saying, you ask the simple question, Benjamin, why didn't he do these things the first time? Under him, uh, J.B. Dankwa died. Samuel Enin died under him. Now, suddenly he's able to investigate the, the death of Ahmed Swali. What happened to Enin? What about J.B. Dankwa's death? Why was he not investigated? If it was that simple to just investigate that in a broad stroke, one time we have investigated it's done. Why was that not done? So clearly, I, I am unimpressed, and I think that a lot of Ghanaians are unimpressed, and it's my responsibility as Director of Communication and um, all uh, Ghanaians and my party to ensure that we engage this communication to ensure that Ghanaians understand the, the state of mind of the NDC, the desperation with which they are operating, and that at this point they are willing to say anything and everything uh, insofar as they think that will be something sound, that sounds well to the voters, they will repeat it without any iota of intent to deliver. And they cannot deliver, uh, Benjamin, because their record shows. So I've thoroughly examined the 13 items or so that the former president enumerated, and every one of them cannot, he will not, be able to fulfill them. And it comes to the... Uh, the banking sector situation where he says he'll restore their licenses. I wonder how he'll be able to do that. And maybe uh, my sister Joyce can just demonstrate for us. Because at 9.30, uh, which were, they amended before leaving office, uh, clearly specifies how you deal with uh, banks or the regulation of banking sector, sector problems, right? So if a bank um, has so much uh, been mismanaged, such that they are illiquid, you cannot, by that a dictate of that law, uh, continue to uh, uh, support or provide uh, liquidity support to that government, uh, so that bank. And if on the basis of that uh, a bank collapses, how, uh, how is it going to uh, restore the licenses to those banks? Is it a question of providing them money? Is it a question where he's alleging that the law was not properly applied? And so I, I am at sea exactly how the former president intends to fulfill any of these uh, things that is enumerated. If you take them one by one, you come to see that really these are just words put out to try to convince people, but unfortunately they are not convincing at all. And we will ensure that Ghanaians understand them simply as words that are being said to um, gain votes but there isn't any real intent or capacity or intention uh, to be able to uh, salvage the Richard, I, of fulfillment. Right. I posed the question earlier as part of my initial uh, submission. I asked you, the, the election of John Dramani Mahama, did it send any shivers down the spine of the MPP following the rhetoric that we've seen from different ends within your party? In fact, on the back of the election on social media, there were some pointing to the vote count, the vote tallying, and suggesting that even that was wrong, a number of things. Uh, some suggest that that is only because you're quaking in your boots on the back of this election. What is your reaction to that? Benjamin, not at all. I was just uh, letting you understand why that can, uh, the re-election as the leader of the NDC, uh, the flag bearer of the NDC, of the former president, cannot be any cause for worry for the new patriotic party because of these things we know his record we know uh, how um, he is operated and we know what conversation to have with Ghanaians to understand uh, the situation of a, a former president who wants to come back and who in his first era or his first term um, as president before he lost could not deliver everything or anything uh, that is promising out of this state thing. Maybe, maybe just as your party has not been able to deliver on your mandate as well? Well, um, we can have a conversation about that and you can tell me exactly what we have not delivered on. Um, I, can, I, can name, I can name a number of them. One of them actually is on the chopping board this morning, planting for food and jobs.
Okay. Okay. Well, you can, if we're, when it comes to planting for food and job, you can have a conversation about the extent of uh, implementation um, of that uh, project, but you cannot at any point say that it wasn't implemented and it wasn't successful. We can quibble about the extent and how much more needs to be done. That is a clear uh, policy conversation that can be had. Uh, but I won't, uh, Benjamin, I won't have you sway me away from the conversation right now. Uh, but the idea... There's no I want attempt. To, yeah. So, no, no. The, the, the idea I want to express in, in very simple terms is that the former president needs to answer the simple question of why he didn't do this before when he was in, 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 uh, he was in office, um, to the extent that uh, now he's making those promises without even expressing why he failed or that he recognizes that he failed to do these things and so therefore now he's learned something different. I, I hear the, uh, the positioning to say that his experience um, uh, behind him, uh, but I don't think that uh, that alone is convincing if he fails to admit the failings through which he learned or he acquired the experiences he's trying to refer to. He definitely did fail uh, in the first experiment. Uh, to where he ran. I mean, I see something here which is very interesting when the former president talks about uh, creating uh, more jobs for Ghanaians, uh, the Ghanaian youth. And you remember at a point when the former president, in desperation, when uh, the youth of this country were agitating uh, for the very harsh conditions under which they were living under his administration, he told Ghanaians that he was not a magician. He told Ghanaians, the youth, that he was not a magician. To the extent he said that, now, if he says he's going to be able now to create employment for uh, Ghanaians, uh, Ghanaian youth, then he should be in a position to um, express some remorse and failings and why he thought that before he couldn't do it and why he thinks that now he has the capacity to do it. And I heard also in here on the point nine specifically, interestingly, the mention of S. Gracia again, um, uh, it's, it's interesting. Uh, currently, he continues to accept it, uh, but then if it comes to office, then you abolish it. It doesn't, for me, tell consistency. Right. And that, that, for me, is something that is worrying. So the sum total of what I'm saying, uh, Benjamin, simply is that the former president simply is not convincing because everything he says is weighed against his record, and it always comes back short to say that you had the opportunity, you couldn't do it. It's not as if anybody stopped you, but you just couldn't manage the economy such that you'll be able to deliver those. Now, what you're asking for requires that you manage the economy. You have not demonstrated the capacity when you had it the first time to, to be able to deliver uh, on those things. So clearly, he's not able to deliver. But what it is right. that is happening I, now I think... is just worse to convince mm -hmm. us to vote for him which we are going to make sure Ghanaians are reminded of his record. Uh, thank you, Richard. Let me come back to Joyce Bauer Mokhtari right before I come into the studio. Uh, Joyce, so a number of matters have been made mention of from the banking sector and the promises that are being made. In fact, this morning there's one newspaper, I believe the Chronicle, that couches uh, a story, Mahama to return Unibank to Dufour. Of course, he didn't say, he didn't mention uh, specifically, but he, it was a blanket statement he passed about the banking sector and the return of licenses. Mention has also been made by Richard of employment and the seeming deceit of uh, the former president, together with Ahmed Hussein Swale's situation and all of that. What are your reactions? I know you have a few. What are they? Uh, Benjamin, before I even get to my reactions, let me speak categorically that when I listen to Mr. Richard Ahiagba, my brother, it is very obvious that he forgets that when you live in a glass house, Kindly don't throw stones. You live in a government that has failed entirely to deliver on any promise they ever made to the good people of Ghana. He literally speaks from the left and right of his mouth, and I think all he thinks about is how to make President Mahama look out sound and convincing. Benjamin, that we are actually where we are, that we have so many Ghanaians, young and old, who are listening and paying rapt attention, who are actually watching and waiting to see just what Mr. Mahama has to offer, tells you one thing, that Mr. Mahama has proven himself resilient enough. If Mr. Mahama has had occasion to indicate 
Now, he didn't say that everything was perfect under his word. But, Benjamin, go back and check the Corruption Perfection Index. We were doing much better. Go and check the Press Freedom. We were doing much better. Check the Ghana Integrity Initiative Report. We were doing much better. In terms of even your media freedom, we were doing much better. In terms of tolerance, taking of responsibility, leadership, equity, we were doing much better. You know, I don't usually want us to belabor the point about the past, but certainly the MPP is in government. How have you, Benjamin, rated them in terms of all the high polluting promises they made? I have made up my mind to do one thing, that I want all Ghanaians to start to look to the future, looking forward to the fact that John Gamani Mahama has a pair of hands that we have all experienced, that beyond the noise, beyond the propaganda, and beyond all the empty criticisms that we are very quick to voice up to the others when we live mopped in a government that has now been totally owned by corruption. That everything that President Akufuado promised to do, he has failed abysmally to do. All the reasons why Dr. Mahmoud Obamia, our Vice President, was selected, nominated, and touted as the reason why the MPP ought to be in government so they could better manage the economy on all the key facets of our economy, this government has failed to deliver and failed to perform. So when you have a spokesperson from this government coming out to come and tell us, you know, it's even laughable. I actually pity him. And I listen to the voice that didn't sound as confident as he used to. I listened to a man who was speaking to matters that he himself knows cannot be put to six foot. But he knows that John Mahama has literally proven himself to be a man whose word counts for what it means. A man who walks his talk. Indeed, President Mahama had occasion to be questioned about his record in office. And I'm sure that over the years, he has answered those questions adequately. Look, in terms of speaking about matters to do with banking sector cleanup and whether or not licenses will be retained, first and foremost, there were some banks that really were not insolvent. Whose licenses were revoked as well? This is the conversation that we are all going to have going forward. Secondly, on terms of the economy, how are we faring on all our economic indicators? For all that was told us and how it was said, please don't allow anybody to take anything away from anything that President Mahama has said in his acceptance speech or in the campaign as it's gone along. President Mahama is a man who understands this country, right. who understands our politics. He's a statesman who has lived it and worked it. And look, nobody says that John Mahama intends to preside over a perfect country. But are we asking the question whether or not John Mahama is experienced enough to do the things that he says he will do? He says yes. He says, put me to the strict test. Ask me. Put me on the table and ask me when the time comes whether or not I intend to do A, B, or C. If in eight years the MPP has failed to deliver on every promise they made, but, 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 but the point, the point to be made as well, Joyce, the point to be made as well, Joyce, uh, pardon the inter interjection, is that he, he had an initial term and some of these things he's talking about, uh, he had spoken of before. What happened? No, things like what? Give me an example. Employment, like for example. Things he had spoken about the employment metrics and uh, all the things that would be done to create all jobs. All, all, None all too the, different from this administration, really. On all the metrics on employment. President Mahama was doing much better than what Akufuado has done. That is the question of fact. A few days ago, the statistical service released some data that two out of every three women you meet is unemployed. Please check the record. We got the same under John Damani Mahama. Look, Evans, Benjamin, sorry. We have some very deep challenges. And I remember even then, President Mahama used to tell us that the only way we could fix some of the challenges we have is that we change the face of the economy. What did he do in that step? He tried very hard to industrialize our county, to revamp factories that were no longer working, to ensure that we could even start to look locally, tax back on some imports, improve on agriculture, so that at least we could improve on our forex to CD indexes. 
You know, let me put it very, very succinctly. I do not think that we want to sit here and seek to use President Mahama not as a yardstick, but as an example. John Mahama, on everything that he said, spoke in all honesty. You remember the crippling challenges to do with Dumso and power outages. How much support did John Mahama at the time receive from anybody and either one of us? People spent time on propaganda instead of offering solutions. Eventually, we went out there and got a fantastic alternative, a sustainable way to repair this particular challenge, and that was to invest in independent power producers. Benjamin, question our opponents. How they took this conversation, how they politicized and weaponized it until everybody believed that they were going to come into office and do a better job. Let me tell you something. That when a failed individual comes out there to tell you to question what somebody who looks promising wants to offer you, examine his reasons for so saying. Okay. They have no campaign message. They have no alternative message. They have absolutely no positive story to share. They mm. went out there to select a special prosecutor. They passed an act. What did the first special prosecutor tell you and I and the good people of Ghana? You see, look, people are very discerning now. We are examining each and everything that we say and how we do it. Nobody believes Mr. Richard Abia Ayagba on anything that he says because he lives in Ghibli House and Ghibli House has failed abysmally to deliver. People do know that John Mahama, on the other hand, was making a great effort, but for the challenges to do with propaganda and a government in waiting that refused to see anything positive in what was going on. People have had reason now to vest both with the NDC and the NPC. It was also insightful that John Mahama stood in the auditorium of the UDS as he did in the campus of the University for Health and Allied Sciences to launch his promising campaign. Right. He has suffered a lot of things. Can we kindly focus on examining what President Mahama intends to do for the good people of Ghana? When we make comparisons, let's remember that the government that Mr. Dahabba says has totally failed to deliver on everything we ask. I, I, think, I, I think that, that know, point I is... I want us to say one thing, Benjamin. Mm. Can we focus more on what John Mahama has to offer? On the promise that he delivers to the people of Ghana? On the hope that he offers us? Look, I, look very closely at John Damani Mahama. At the man who has lived and loved his country all his life. A man to whom many opportunities have been given by the good people of Ghana. In his modesty, in his tolerance, in the manner in which he took responsibility for doing so, even to the point where it literally sank his government. And you are in the media. You know exactly what happened. You can recount the story. On the Honorable J.B. Dankwa, even the investigation has traveled into the NPP administration. Kindly ask them how have they concluded on that investigation that was handed over to the administration. In terms of Ahmed Swali, are they not in office? Have they not been here for eight years? Mm. How have they fed in that investigation? In terms of all the other facets of our democracy, how have they fed on the economy? How have they fed on, you know, building up the city? How have they fed on repairing a difficult and challenging system in which we live? How have they managed the national health insurance scheme? Right. How have they managed our health infrastructure? You know, there right. are so many things on which they have failed. And please, as I keep saying, please don't bring someone like Richard to try and tell us whether or not Mr. Mahama has been successful or well, not. Well, po point, point made at that. Uh, open your phone line to the people who matter the most. Right. Don't we we, we do that a lot, actually. In a house and throwing glass, if are throwing stones as though he doesn't realize where he is. Of course. I don't expect Mr. Yadah Hadjabba to see anything beautiful about the dance in Mr. Mahama. Or the promise in terms of money. I, 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 I believe, sure I believe for most people, people, Joyce, I believe for most people, uh, from, you know, from what we let's gather, let's... most people are satiated and very wary of promises. And that's why we are putting uh, you to the wall, so to speak, just to answer some of these questions. But I want this conversation, I want to apportion this cake of time to everybody. Uh, I've not got to my guest in studio. I just want your very, very quick, in, in uh, as few seconds as you can muster, I'm sorry I have to uh, do this, but Richard posed a question about the banking sector and the return of 
banking licenses as briefly as you can. How is that going to be done? If you can explain for us, please. Well, first and foremost, we do know that they use too much money to go and chase this exercise. That's one. Secondly, you and I both know that not all of those banks, at least I have the example of the Heritage Bank, that bank actually has some good money. What happened to the money? So you see, President Mahama said, for those banks whose licenses were wrongfully revoked, and these are matters that will be investigated, He's actually going to make it a very public and transparent exercise. We will have committees and commissions set up to have these people come and make a case for themselves. Apart from that, how about all the people who lost their jobs? In any case, Benjamin, how did that resolve the matters at hand? The bank is still in crisis. Look at what is happening with the DDEP and being unable to pay. Are we then waiting to take the IMF money and use that to pay for persons whose pensions are locked up? For persons whose euro bond money are locked up. I mean, look, President Mahama has made very profound statements. And I have no doubt in my mind that these matters will be closely examined. We will also expose the fact that the money they claim to have used to collapse those banks was false, that the accounting was false, that the figures were not even correct, and that indeed those monies were expended on wasted and opulence and corruption and not necessarily to go and uh, you know, reset the banking sector. The few banks that are surviving are struggling under enormous pressure. That whole banking sector needs to be re-examined very closely. How come that a bank like Data Bank is the only bank that is currently surviving? You know, look, let me tell you one thing, Benjamin. President Mahama is very conscious of the fact that people do not want empty, hallowed promises. People don't want empty, high saluting conversations. Where the conversation, where that just mean nothing, propaganda that stands for nothing. President Mahama has put forth 13 key items that he intends to visit. And he has said it clearly that on ex Gracia, for example, whoever I appoint him to the executive will agree and make an undertaking that they would not. Look, we have colleagues of ours who have spoken at length against the collection of ex Gracia. Note also in terms of the Constitutional Amendment uh, Review Commission's work. This is a particular provision that has come under enormous criticism by the good people of Ghana. When you talk about a leader who wants to listen to people, what do you do? These conversations are born out of research, out of long and lengthy conversations with the length and breadth of the good people of Ghana. Please put under scrutiny, examine each and every word offered by President John Damani. And then we can continue to have this conversation. What this does is to strengthen these policies, to crystallize them in the minds of people, to make it even more possible for people to literally question when the time comes, whether or not we have been able to deliver. He is not going to go and speak to empty 171 questions, and then when the time comes for him to perform, he feels abysmally, and yet still tries as much as possible to hit mad on the doorstep of somebody who is at least making an effort. Let's remember that some leaders also ought to remember that anything in your criticism, you ought to be measured when you know that your government has failed. You ought also not to remember that every government will have its feelings. But I think in terms of sins, when you put them on the list of 1 to 10, there are fewer sins for the NDC. And for the NDC, that is currently in office and has been there for eight years. So I believe that we have made it a point to impact positively okay. on every facet of our lives as a people. Let so me Mahama come. is our flag bearer, and your mama has spoken. We have his record, and I think that that is a job that the media can do and do effectively. Joyce, I think, I think you've, you've uh, expatiated enough on, on the record bit. I'll give you the opportunity to touch more on that. Uh, but let me come into the studio. We also have Dr. Tutu Bwahene. He's a political marketing consultant at the University of Education, where they're back together with uh, Musa Dankwa, Executive Director, Global Info Analytics. I'll start with you, Musa. Did you see this coming, uh, the... the gargantuan lead that John Dramani Mahama took right from the start of the process, the election, uh, to the end. And what were your projections? You've been on the ground. Yes. What were your projections? Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, it wasn't surprising at all to us. Um, from what we knew from last year, January, we knew John Mahama was going to do a minimum of 94%. Right. And um, but the surveys you had conducted. Yeah, surveys we've done. And we were given... Um, do for around 4% and Kojibonsu uh, around 2%. Okay. But when 
before we drew from the race, we have to revise the projections or the, the, the poll and then do a projection based on what we knew at the time. And we were saying that he was going to get at least 98% from what we knew on the ground. So that was your projection post, post the poll. what happened? Yes, yes right. 98%. And mm -hmm. I think he got slightly higher than that. 98.9%. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't surprising to us <clears throat> at all. And um, what really, for us, disappointed us was that we wanted Dufour to be in the race. Mm. So we could test some of our hypotheses that we've been uh, undertaking. Uh, with that absence, we couldn't do that. And for us, that was very unfortunate. We wish he had stayed in the race. Um, but largely, I think everything was in line with our projections and work that we did. How, how does this feed or factor into the grand scheme of, of things, your projections over time? Uh, of course, Kwabna Dufour pulled out. All of us would have wanted to see how oh. it would go if he had run. But interestingly, you would note that he still got some votes. He did. There were a few. Of course, they did not. He didn't declare it. Yes. Uh, uh, but he still got, you would see two here, three there, 30 there, 20 there. He still got some votes from uh, some of the voters. And uh, it would have been interesting, like you mentioned, to see how that would have panned out. But how does this factor in the grand scheme of things? Your projections over time for John Romani Mahama and what he has secured vis-a-vis -vis the situation we are in, the state of our economy and everything else, and the ruling administration. What picture does that paint? Um, it, it goes back to the overall uh, narrative that John Mahama is going to receive massive support from the polling at the moment so far. What we've seen is that he's overperforming his polling numbers. Historically, he's been doing he's that. He's overperforming. Yes, his polling numbers. Historically, he's been doing that, and that trend hasn't changed. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the national outlook and where we are with the economy, I think he's been propelled by the economy situation that we find ourselves in. Okay. A lot of voters have confidence in him when it comes to the economy. And indeed, if you look at those who trust him to be able to dealing with the issues. It's about 43% of Ghanaians trust him. Next to him is Baumia on 17%, far behind. Now, if you look at the specifics of people who said economy is a top issue, he gets 57% against Baumia. Baumia gets 37%. Against Alan. So the former president gets a better score in terms of the economic dynamic dynamics versus the current vice president. Absolutely. And if Alan, if Alan does slightly better than Baumia, 2%. Better than Baumia against Mahama. But, mm. but the overall impression is that unless the economy takes a different turn in the right direction, it's going to be very tough for the MPP in 2024. Which is reflective of what the EIU has also uh, shared. But, but for you, Doc, uh, on, on the back of what we saw on Saturday, any surprises in there where your projections also that the former president would get this, these number, numbers of votes and... What does this basically mean for the NDC as a party? Yeah, so, um, it is, as um, Musa has said, um, it wasn't, or it is not surprising to see, you know, the uh, ex-president pulling such value. Um, obviously, um, as even the NDC party itself indicated, he has the brand, um, he has the support of the grassroots, and, and everything was working for him. So obviously, when you check the various constituencies and um, the various areas where you know um, the NC, NDC had you know huge representations like Ashamine, you know um, everybody was going for him. So obviously, you knew or you know um, at first hand that um, he was going to pull the numbers. Um, again, um, we were actually expecting some kind of. Um, um, credible, strong, you know, kind of um, opposition, you know, in this race, um, that will probably put the ex-president, you know, on another level of competition. Um, but it, it, it turns out to be that, you know, the, the, the kind of competition that he received obviously was not such strong for him, you know, to reduce the numbers that we were expecting him to have. Uh, what it means to the NDC party is that um, when we check the statistics, um, not just the, the, the percentage, which is the 98.9, but the various um, constituencies and the numbers that were coming, mm. um, you could see 
that he has um, appreciated strongly, you know, against previous um, um, elections or primaries. And that tells you that he has actually um, gathered a lot of support in some of these areas. In fact, for you to get uh, an absolute figure of about 2,880 from a shaman, that is very powerful. And even though we know that Ashama is a strong um, area for the NDC, um, it tells you that um, the delegates went for him. And if the, um, the voting pattern in these areas is anything to go by in terms of the representation on the ground, then obviously we would expect, you know, as Mrs. Um, Paul has you know, predicted, that um, it is going to be a straight win probably for the NDC come 2024. That is, if things don't change, you know, and it continues to be the way it is. Um, some of these polls or some of this um, research sometimes is subject to certain environmental... You know, there are different uh, variables to take stock exactly, of. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so if certain things change, then obviously um, it is going to cause some kind of problems. And so um, for the party, what it means is that the NDC party must not relent on its efforts. Um, they shouldn't be complacent and they shouldn't even think that um, victory has been, you know, um, handed over to them on a silver platter. What it means is that the, the successes of the 2023 uh, presidential and parliamentary primaries means that the party needs to work harder, even harder, and stay united, stay focused with their campaign. If they are able to do that, then of course, um, the chances would be enhanced. And probably um, env environmental effects, other you know, um, dynamics may not really affect their chances. Right. Let, 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 and I'm going to pose these two questions to both of you as well, and, uh, and then I'll take it to Richard and uh, Joyce. So you look at some of the promises that have been made by former President Mahama. He, he touches on the economy, salvaging the economy, ramping up employment, um, working on the banking sector. It has faced myriad problems. It still is my in some problem on the back of the DDEP. Uh, and he says he's going to return certain licenses uh, to those who are unfairly treated. He talks about 60 ministers at post, including deputies, and the fact that ex gratia is going to be cancelled, is going to be a thing of the past. Then, this that he says as well, prepare your handing over notes to Mahama. And he's, you know, putting that to the MPP, basically telling them that they have been so incompetent, this uh, Kufuado Baumia administration, they've mismanaged the economy, and that the only way forward is an NDC government. On the back of the promises he's made, and then putting that side by side with what he says about handing over notes, yes, the projections are that he would likely win. But is the former president, and maybe by extension the NDC, becoming too cocksure? What's your take? Now, he mentioned the economy, the economy, and the jobs. Now, these are the two most important issues to voters right now. If you look at the top three issues for voters, it's economy, jobs, and education. If you run any campaign that belittles these three issues, you are out. So I think his emphasis on those two are critical for him. <clears throat> and in the context of the banking license being returned, I think it is just to ensure that his job numbers that he's promising may also go up. Because if you are last one of the banks, you know, probably the small micro finance companies to start operating again, you're going to be able to open up the job market <clears throat> and get more people into the job. So it's linked to his jobs. Now, with regards to um, uh, handing over notes, you have to be confident, but not overly confident. Mm. Now, probably you send a message out there to the MPP and to the NDC folks, and even indeed to Ghanaians, that the way things are going, he's going to be with uh, the president of Ghana in 2025. So he's quite confident. But that doesn't mean that they should just go and sleep. Because it wouldn't be handed over to them on a silver platter. The poll numbers at the moment, averagely 14% lead. Mm. It is quite huge. We expect the 14% lead, lead on, 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 on the, him winning the presidency. 
Okay. The minimum against Allen, 14%. Against Bahamia or Kennedy is about 17%. Wow. Now, we know the polls will narrow over time. But this gap is quite huge that it will take a lot of time for MPP to close the gap. And unless the economic situation really turns around positively, it's, it's tough time. It's going to be a tough time. Yes. For you? Yes. So um, confidence um, in, in, in the banking sector, um, I think that it is a major and a topical issue, you know, currently. But, you know, um, as you try to bring confidence into the banking sector, um, we want to see um, what actually necessitated, you know, the, um, um, this DDEP thing to um, happen in the first place. Um, it, is, it is as a result of the IMF conditionality that has caused some of these things. Now, my question to this promise is as to whether it is um, um, one of those promises or it is a reality. Because obviously when IMF is involved, and it is a conditionality, then of course, any president that comes, we need to follow the dictates of the IMF. Now, with regards to um, the economy, um, I am happy to see in the, in, the, in the speech note that the first thing that um, former president said is that he is taking or he will take responsibility of the economy. And I believe the, the, the ex-president understands exactly what it means to take responsibility of um, a position. Um, I believe the party executives and all other ministers who work, will be working with him understand that taking responsibility in government means, you know, you take um, responsibility of whatever um, has been left behind, whether it is an asset, mm whether it is a debt. And the question is, how do you manage your assets and debt ratios? Mm. Now, if you understand these things and you are going to work towards it, then of course, we are safe as a country. But if it is going to be a blame game, as we've seen previously, you know, that a government comes and begin to point fingers at the previous government, that they did this and they did that, and they did this, it would be a waste of time to all of us and to the whole country. Okay. With the issue of um, governance, where we are talking about um, reducing ministers to 60, the issue of S. Gracia, that is very important to every Ghanaian asset now. Because I think that the belief behind this is that um, there is a huge chunk of money going into the, the, the salaries and allowances and remunerations of, you know, ministers. And so if you have a large government, what it means is that um, we are overspending and we are going beyond our budget. Um, secondly, people also believe that the ex gratia is monies that probably um, are not supposed to be paid. Mm. Obviously, a teacher who... This worked morning I interacted for, with Suleiman Abraima. He calls it immoral. Exactly. Very immoral. Mm. See, you a teacher who works for over 40, 50, 60 years, goes on retirement and is given a pension pay. So why can't we do the same? The argument that the parliamentarian or a minister spends less time in government is neither here nor there. Just as the teacher decided to, to be a professional teacher, you also decided to be a politician. And so if you, you have developed your career as a politician, then you should also go by the Social Security and National in Insurance Trust Fund, all right, so that in your four years, you get paid by the SNIT contribution that you've made, not to pick state money and then give it to you. That is why politics has become so attractive to people who don't even deserve to be in politics. Right. My, please, my last point has to do with the handing over you know, notes. Mm. Uh, for me, I see something beyond confidence. I see accountability. Now, if we are giving you the handing over notes, to what extent are you going to use it? Is it going to be shelved in the archives? Or you are going to pick and then see who committed what wrong? What kind of financial 
loss was caused by who and what accountability are you bringing to the table? So for me, the handing over notes shouldn't be anything about confidence, but he should pick it in case he wins. All right. Pick it and then bring people who have caused financial losses to this country to book. Joyce Bawa Mokhtari, uh, if you listen to what uh, Musa Dankwa has shared with us, the percentage point spread, John Dramani Mahama, per the surveys he has conducted over Alan Chamate, about 14% over Baumia, Dr. Baumia and uh, Kennedy Ejapong, among others, about 17%. That would corroborate what the EIU has been saying. But with these utterances by the former president, they should prepare their handing over notes. Is the NBC becoming cocksure? What I can say for John Dramani is the fact that he is the first to tell us we must excuse complacency. He has told us all in no uncertain terms that the work begins today, the work starts now. And I have told my colleagues and my friends that from henceforward, each day, each night, we must go to every extent possible to deliver our messages, to convince the voter public, to convince the media, to work very hard to sell our message, to reveal our message. When you have a good message, you must have great messengers. You must have a good way of communicating that message. Above all, I have always used as my yardstick the image and persona of John Dramani Mahama. A humble man, a decent man, a man who has enormous respect, who raises the bar at every turn. I use him as my example each morning. And each day before I start to sell a message associated with John Damani Mahama, I ask myself, what would the boss say and how would he say it? I think Ghanaians know who John Mahama is. They appreciate who he is. They would expect that he would do his very best to convince each and every one of us that he is the man to lead us. The competition has moved away from the National Democratic Congress Party. It is now going to be a very public and keenly contested, uh, you know, one, based on ideas, based on experience, based on what you have to offer, based on who even is going to help you deliver on the promises you've made, as the last panelist has just indicated. Indeed, Benjamin, I am hoping that you in the media will play the best role ever as we go along in investigating each and everything. Get it. Question us, challenge us, but above all, keep a record. Like Mr. Franklin Kito said yesterday, that when the time comes, we should be able to put us to the test. You see, one thing we are all forgetting is that we have arrived at this point because of all the empty promises made by then President Akufuadu and Vice President Mahmoud Ibrahim. And I'm happy to hear this morning that when we all have these conversations, let's remember that one of the most inept individuals we have in office today, our Vice President, is the one that President Akufuado intends to force on the good people of Ghana. He will be asked questions about his record, about the 170 questions that he has been unable to answer over eight years, about his failure as the helm of the economic management team. A few days ago, I asked, where is our senior minister, Mr. Honorable Otaku Mafu? I haven't heard about him in a long time. I'm sure a lot of them are very jittery and completely ashamed about right. how this government has been. So, Benjamin, please ask me a question any day and time, and ask any other person who either speaks for John Mahama, represents the NDC, or is a good citizen of Ghana. I'm now, sure we can continue to have this conversation. Right. The next level. Right. In terms of we're, all the individuals currently putting themselves up, I have no doubt in my mind that John Mahama stands for. And I believe he will take responsibility for right. the company and mm. make sure that he takes us to victory come 2024. And yes, then how, how, how though, mm, how though going into 2024, because like you rightly said, the hurdle of the party is done. Now is the bigger hurdle, the national hurdle in 2024. How is he going to shrug off accusations of being corrupt, of being a weak leader of being incompetent. Those are not my words. Those are the words actually of one of his contenders, Kojo Bonsu, who said that he had been tainted too much with the black paintbrush of being incompetent and of being or supervising uh, over corruption. How is the former president going to be able to 
discard that impression ahead of 2024? Let well, me put this without any fear of equivocation. That on all the points that you just made, Mr. Mahama has been validated. Indeed, for those who touted his incompetence, they have even been more incompetent, more inept, and absolutely useless. You see that word has suddenly vanished. I believe the media helped make that word what it is today. And we all know that President Muhammad certainly is not any of those things that you just described. Secondly, for the person who you claim said those things, please go and look at himself. That is record. Look at him as an individual. Should he even be qualified to be saying such things? And should he be giving people like this, you know, vim and, you know, some sort of vent some of the things that they say? Ask who Mr. Kodubosu is. A former employee, a former appointee of John Damani Mahama. I will not actually believe at that point. Vet the person who says what about somebody. Find out if they themselves have all the so-called qualities that they speak of, or whether or not they can even stand in contest with the individual called John Damani Mahama. You know, we will eschew all complacency. And in all humility, right. accept this responsibility. Mm. Take this country to the next level. All I ask is what John Mahama has been asking. Join him to build the Ghana that we all want. And this is a government for the people, by the people, not just for John Mahama, Mahama, or just for the NDC. All of us together must work to ensure that first, we see the back of this inept NDC administration. Secondly, that we ensure that when John Mahama Mahama becomes president, all of you will be part of the process to build the Ghana Important point, important points you've made. Richard, uh, on the back of the statistics, it appears for all of those in the uh, studio, and of course Joyce Bauer Mokhtari, who speaks for the former president, the verdict from the polls we have so far, whether it's the EIU's own verdict or Global Info Analytics, it is that the superior candidate going into election 2024 is John Dramani Mahama. Now, whether it's uh, Dr. Baumia or and Alan Chermating or whoever else emerges as flag bearer of your party, going toe to toe with such a candidate, a juggernaut, so to speak, would be incredibly difficult, wouldn't it? And on what credentials, basically, will the MPP be, be latching its hopes? You're hoping to break the eight. In fact, it's been a while since I heard of that break the eight mantra. What do you think? Um, you've been a bit unfair to me. Um, you've gone to my sister several times and once only to me. I hope you give me some time to address. Uh, that that, that, that is not correct. Initially, I gave you quite a bit of time, went to her, came into okay. the studio, and I just came to her first, and I'm coming to you. Okay, well, you went to her three times. So that's all I want to say. Now, okay, so let me make the point. Um, you see, uh, <laughs> my good sister only used words, and words are not going to cut it this time. And I'm quite happy that the former president, uh, he probably thought through this and wants to convince Ghanaians by saying, I want you to hold me accountable to this. Right? His record is his measure. This is a simple fact of the matter. His record is a measure. Joyce talked about corruption and that look at the corruption perception index. The former president excused everything in the book for the corruption that pervaded under him. In a BBC interview, he talked about how is it that corruption is perceived to be high in Ghana because environment is being created and people are talking about it. Is that an empirical measure he wants to say now? When he was excusing that, oh, he is not corrupt or his government is not corrupt and that it is only um, high, perceived, uh, Ghana is perceived as uh, corrupt because people are cor talking about corruption because somehow he has created an environment for people to talk about corruption. Can you imagine the double standard here? There isn't anything substantial that uh, Sister Joyce or the former president says that he can point to that they themselves before have not invalidated themselves. If you talk about the banking sector, I want my sister Joyce, why he can't, she cannot answer the question, she pivoted away and talking about how banking sector banks are suffering and struggling today owing to DDEP. The substantial question asked was whether there was anything wrong with the banking sector crisis, the banking sector cleanup. And I want to add, Benjamin, that what happened there, what created the need for the banking sector cleanup. The simple answer for that is that the NDC failed under former President Mahama to enforce the law. 
And so what was done in cleaning the banking sector was fundamentally enforcing the law. And the Bank of Ghana has come out. And Benjamin, you, you have access to that document. When the, uh, the Bank of Ghana indicated that it went according to the rules, the law, Act 9, uh, 930, okay? So there isn't anything there to quibble about. So if the former president says that he's going to restore the banking licenses of the banks that did not survive, the point we want to raise is that what is wrong with the process? Okay. Is to, raise, is to raise an issue with the enforcement of Act 930, which was used to clean the banking sector, which they failed to, you know, to, to enforce. So there isn't anything there. So that promise is a vain promise because there isn't any problem there to fix. If anything at all, if anything at all, he should show us what law was breached and if the law was not adhered to in the cleanup. Number two. The former president talked about employment and that he's going to create jobs and that he's going to build some Ghana in which work and happiness will return R again. Richard, uh, I, I, I thought you had addressed that in your first turn. These no, no, two matters George you had already brought this, up. This, this was the point I was trying to make to you, that when Joyce uh, came in, these were the erroneous impression that she sought. So, so these are rebuttals work. before you get to yes, my yes, substantive exactly. point. So please, just okay. briefly. All right, so, so he talked briefly about employment. That. And employment, it was under former President Mahama, I told you. He told Ghanaian straightforward that, you know, he's not a magician. Has to give them jobs. He, he just said, plainly said that. It was under former President John Dramani Mahama that in this country, graduates from school who have invested time and learned and acquired skills that are useful to our development. He could not place them anywhere. He could not find jobs for them. His economy did not create any jobs to absorb them. And so we had an unemployed graduate association in this country. Is we, that we, we still do have them, though. You know that. I'm, well, I'm talking about a genesis. Yes, but I'm telling you, we still do have them. You came to remedy the situation. We still have the unemployed graduate association. Yeah, Benjamin, I, I hear your question, but I'm telling you the genesis. Right? Something created it. And once the situation was created, you are managing the situation to resolve the issue. He created that. Because, of course, they, they'll be happy any time the NDC will tell you that governance is a continuum. So if he creates a problem, that problem is being solved. And in the process of solving that problem, uh, a global disaster hits our economy, which, of course, will come to. So I'm saying that. The, the business of the former president talking about his coming and creating the impression as though somebody is not um, delivering today is just erroneous. Point made. Does, does, does the NPP have the men or the women to overtake John Dramani Mahama ahead of 2024? Substantive question. Do you have the men or women to do that? Uh, what do you call uh, Benjamin? We defeated former president John Dramani Mahama when he was the president. We defeated him. So that question does not arise. It's just an interesting political question to ask, but it's not a substantial question. The key question we want to ask is, uh, ask and should continue to ask, are the deliverables? Former President uh, Mahama was the president of this country. When he took over in 2013, this economy, even though it slumped from the high 14% which they, we, uh, they reached, because of the, um, the oil discovery in 20, 2009, which they started uh, commercializing or exploiting in uh, 2014, right? The economy dropped even from 49.3, and when he took over in 2013, former President Mahama did not increase the performance of the economy above the level he inherited. The economy dropped in 2014, 2013, and 2017, and 2016 when he left office, right? The borrowing that they keep talking about, Benjamin, the former president is on record to have borrowed 50% of the total debt of Ghana in 2014. So you tell me what economic record he has and how has he proven himself to be able to manage this economy so much to provide employment? It is interesting you bring that point up because while I agree with you that he had borrowed quite a quantum of money, you look at that quantum of money vis-a-vis -vis what we have borrowed, the over 400 uh, billion that has been borrowed in this administration. Of course, we cannot 
it would be like comparing pears and oranges, wouldn't it? Realistically. I've heard well, that yes, argument so, before, and we all know how that goes. Yes, no, 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 but, but you see, it's a, it's a good argument to have, uh, Benjamin. So, so you tell me that the, the, the proportion or the amount of debt we have, you are looking at it, and that is what we always say, and the NDC doesn't want it because uh, it feels that it advances their interest. Now, if you look at the debt, vo uh, the debt amount we have today, the best way to understand is to look at it in terms of the rate of accumulation. That's why I told you how much he borrowed single-handedly in one fiscal year. Right. You want to look at the rate of accumulation over time, and that is, this, is declining under this government. Right? And I'll tell you that, for example, much of the money that we have borrowed under this government, and they keep asking you, what have we done with the money? Much of it has gone to dealing with the mess they created. A key one that we've been talking about this morning is the banking sector. Have the NDC enforced the law? Have the NDC not slept on the job? You would not need about $25 billion to bail the banking sector. Now they will tell you about, oh, they were, you use too much money, that's not how we're going to do it. We mm. knew, Benjamin, how they were doing it. They were exactly doing it in the wrong way by throwing good money after bad. And we know now, because of the proceedings in court, that some of these bad actors in the banking sector were taking the liquidity support that the Bank, uh, bank of Ghana was providing to them and investing them in other businesses instead of use it to pay their uh, depositors. So that was the nature. In fact, Benjamin, in all honesty, and this is out of the realms of politics or right. trying to rationalize anything, right. had NDC not lost power in 2016, this country, the bank, our banking sector would just wake up one day and would just collapse on all of us because they were enabling bad behavior. They were not enforcing any law. They were just throwing money at the problem and hoping that the problem somehow... So, 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 some, some will contest you... Right. Some will contest you. The banking sector mm. was a question of enforcement of the law. The law existed. Enforce the law. You know, um, the, uh, Act 6, uh, 612 specified clearly how you support a bank that can benefit through liquidity support. So a bank that is illiquid and solvent can be saved or can be supported. But a bank that is illiquid and insolvent cannot. But they were throwing money at all of this category of banks, and those monies were wasted. Point made. So, uh, even after the banking sector cleanup and now with the DDEP, it would be interesting if you asked any economist, I speak with a lot of them on the show, how mm -hmm. healthy our banks are in the first place. But let's skirt that issue. Uh, we're wrapping the conversation. I'll, I'll have your final takes, uh, lady and gentlemen. But before we get to that final take, Richard Ahyangba, you spoke about corruption. This administration, the current president said he would use the ANAS principle. Uh, Anti-graft campaigners will tell you the ANAS principle maybe has been thrown out the window. But I have a specific question. On the back of Al Jazeera's gold mafia, and I may be steering off a bit, but since you've spoken about corruption, the presidency put out a petition. Al Jazeera threw out, so to speak, that petition. It refused to retract. It refused to apologize. The only option is for the president, as a person, to take up the matter in court, internationally. Is that going to happen? Especially as we're talking of corruption and clearing the president's name. Is that going to happen? Well, uh, Benjamin, I think that determination will be made uh, by the president, um, especially his uh, uh, legal advisor to, uh, on these matters. Uh, but you see, what is clear, what is clear, that you know you don't need the president taking anybody to court to understand is that oh it's not needed it, no i'm just saying i'm saying that his lawyers will advise on what to say i cannot make that uh, um, advice or give that advice on this program and so if that determination is happening now i cannot tell you about that but in court in the due in a due process of time if that becomes the decision we'll all know uh, what it is that the president will do but i was just pointing you to something that is obvious Something that currently exonerates the president, but is that, of course, in the nature of things, we're glossing over it. Now, when you watch the documentary toward, uh, at the end of it, the president's position and the uh, Al Jazeera themselves disclaiming what the, uh, the individual said, that they cannot vouch for this. Now, that clearly tells you 
that they don't have any cocksure evidence. You'll be using the word this morning. And so the, the documentary, the only uh, point that I think the uh, presidency was trying to establish was to have on the record an apology because what statement they have made in their own admission stating that the individual could not validate for them the claim he's made. They just want that admission on record. But the documentary itself has given you that evidence that what you just watched cannot be true. That is already established. So in other words, there's no, need, there's no need for the president to do this, even after the initial um, request for a retraction and apology. You're, you're now basically saying, I mean, let, is that what it boils down to? The president doesn't need to take on no, this no, matter I, any I'm further. Making, I'm making a rationalization to you based on what is already there that you could see, right? But then what I guess the presidency wanted was on record, uh, um, uh, Al Jazeera, stating on the record that, yes, we apologize because they publish something they cannot validate. Of course, when you're okay. publishing these things, uh, not uh, against the president of a country or uh, implicating a president of a country, you must be cocksure of your facts. But then they disclaim that they cannot vouch for this, and the individual who is making this claim himself was not able to prove it to them. Okay. But you see, on the broader issue of corruption, it amazes me that a former president wants to have a conversation about this. He was the one, when he was asked, could not distinguish between whether or not he is corrupt as an individual or as a corporate uh, 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 personality, as the head of state of the country. I am saying that if you can fight corruption, you know it when you are asked a question about it in the daytime or in the nighttime. We're saying that what the former president is doing, and I think my sister Joyce ably is doing that is to add words is to just speak words and hope that people will be convinced and i'm saying to okay. you that this is not convincing i hear uh, my two co panelists in the in the in the in the studio uh musa damkwa um, of global info analytics i know what uh, research they do uh, but i'm saying that the truth of the matter remains with Ghanaians, verifying what he done in the past Okay. These are these what he is promising, and when you put the two side by side, you are lost. Who is speaking now, and who was the president in the past? Okay, so I guess the, 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 the voters the will business. determine on that, uh, as, that. Let, let especially as point, especially yes. as the surveys are showing that. Uh, voters are keenly interested in the economy, job creation, and corruption. We'll see how that goes. I'll give each of you, uh, Richard, I, I, my apologies. I'll give each of you a minute to wrap. In the studio, for both of you, especially on the back of your academic research and the surveys and everything you've been conducting, if voting were to happen today, mm -hmm. <clears throat> whom do you think would come up tops? And on the back of all the discussions we've had, what is your forecast for 2024? If voting were to happen today, Don't I'll start with you. Don't matter will win the race. By what margin? I will go to maybe 52%. 52%? Yes. Against any candidate? Any candidate. Brought to bear by the MPP? Yes. But if it is, if it is, let me be very blunt. If it is Baume, I will look about 53%. So it will be worse if yes. the yes. vice president... I mean, the data is showing that it's clear. You can just ignore the data. But if you look through the data... He's the worst candidate to face John Mahama right now. The worst candidate? Yes. But if the economy gets better, improves, then voters must begin to trust him on the economy. At the moment, Alan is doing better on the economy than him, the economist. Interesting thoughts uh, for you, Dr. Tutubwahi. Yeah, it's 53% um, win. Um, if that is what Musa is predicting, um, would be huge. But you see, in politics, a lot of dynamics. Uh, sometimes somebody tells you the intention, but the behavior in the, in the ballot is different. So probably until the result comes out, you probably cannot firm up whatever research report that you have. But for me, um, I, I am expecting um, a very strong, competitive kind of contest, you know, between um, JDM and whoever comes up from the MPP, you know, side. Um, you cannot rule out the incumbency effect. Mm. And when that comes to play, obviously, 53% may be reduced. 
again, as um, Danko has said, if the economy should change, and uh, more especially when now the three billion dollars, you know, as it is being uh, speculated, may be coming. Now, if it comes and things begin to normalize, um, living standards of people begin to improve, um, fuel prices begin to drop. People, people may begin have, to switch. Exactly. Mm. People may be, you know, um, rescinding on their decisions, you know. And so um, between the NDC and MPP, um, it's just like Kotoko, Asante Kotoko and Accra House of Hope, mm. right? It is, the, the race is not by form. <laughs> Dynamics can change it. And so, but at least um, for me, it will be an interesting competition and it will help in some of these um, um, results. But you see, um, I have not done a research, so I cannot give statistics, but I am definitely going to start one and it will be by segments. Um, and most definitely when it is out, I think that uh, Musa will be working with. What, what are some of the things that if the NDC does, it, it could actually prevent it from securing power in 2024? Maybe scoring at their own goal. I mean, at this stage, look, we've seen a lot of data from various demographics, uh, age groups, educational levels, women, uh, and people, job, I mean, employment status. Benjamin, <clears throat> I think we've put a little out there, but people don't, don't tend to look at data in that context. But what we've seen, and we've been saying that openly to all the parties, that the numbers for MPP is bad. They need to work hard on it. <clears throat> all the demographic. Now we've seen a trend in the older voters, the pension voters, turning hugely against the MPP. Mm. On the back of the DD, DD. among and, others. And okay. that, that we, we, we believe that they will begin to have a sympathy across other demographics. All right. And they have to be very so, careful. So Benjamin, if you can give me a minute. Less than a minute. Yeah, okay. So my issue has to do with trust in governance and, and trust in opposition. At the end of the day, the differences between um, kind of trust that has been proven, you know, is what is going to um, win the election in 2024. So if NDC needs to work, it is an issue of trust. An issue of trust. Exactly. Joyce, your final uh, word in less than a minute. Same for you, Richard. I'll start with you, yeah. Joyce. Well, Benjamin, let me just say very, very quickly that, you know, I don't like to come here and I listen to Richard. He sounds almost as if he hates the fact that John Mahama is standing tall. He sounds full of venom. I don't expect that we'll come here to have debates about our leaders and an individual will be sounding so spiteful and so full of spite. I think that this is a democracy. And like I always say, the presidency is not the best right of the NPP or any individual for that matter. Mm. That any individual who stands tall, who puts up policies that people buy into, who gives the, you know, allows people to feed into and trust the message that he shares. An individual that people have come to know, come to admire, and come to respect. I think that is all of us are, you know, we, we are, we, we, all of us are speaking. Speak to people who want to listen to us. We ought also to allow for people to share whatever views they have. And we need also to speak with a certain modicum of decorum and respect about our leader. Right. I don't think on any day that there is any individual today in the MPP who deserves any more respect or respectability than John Dramani Mahama, a former president of this country, a three-term member of parliament who served in parliament at the same time as President Akufuade. So if Mr. Hiagba has any disrespect, he ought to show it in his home, not on radio, not on a platform of this kind. And let me state without any fear of expectation that John Zamani Mahama has spoken about these banks. And remember that when we left office, we left a blueprint okay. of the bank rationalization policy that was supposed to take place. Mr. Setsekwe is alive. Speak to him if you believe that what I'm saying is incorrect. The same with Galam Faith. Let me tell you that if the MPC had respected their predecessor administration, right. taking some of the cautions and the policy documents that were left, and that believing in democracy, they believed in government being a continuum, they would not have been in the spaces that they are in. They okay. condemned the IMF and anything to do with the IMF. Where are they to be? Please, I will not take moral lessons from Richard. And I've said that before, I'll say that again. John Mahama is a hundred times proven as a man of his word 
than any of the people that we serve. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you for joining the conversation. Richard, uh, back to you. Final words. Back Benjamin, so much for tolerance. Uh, Joy should have listened to the former president yesterday when he was speaking uh, about tolerance. You know, I have nothing but respect for the former president, and uh, Joyce knows about it, and I'm sure the former president knows about it. And so um, I would not speak in any way uh, to attack his personality. I've not done that, and I will not do it. And Benjamin, if I had done anything like that, you would have stopped me this morning. So in other words... George is just going for the body because he has nothing to say uh, in response to all that I've said, which are factual. You see, I, I think that our political discourse must focus on issues and must focus on the record that we have as a party and as a government. And I'm quite happy to debate the record of this government any day against the record of the NDC, and that's really what I want to do. The, the point I am making quite simply is for Ghanaians to ask all these lofty things, much of them that has no vision backing them, is to say that, why did the former president not do these things before if they were doable? Why did he not? So that brings a legitimate question and requires an answer from the, the, the former president and his camp to say that this and this and this were the reasons why we didn't do it. And Benjamin, I assure you right. that when the former president engages in answering that question, mm. that's when we'll realize why he failed. He will be able we'll to see because why you were, not, you were not able to create jobs because he didn't manage the economy well. Okay. You were not able to... Uh, do all the things that you are saying you are able to do if you get a chance because you didn't manage the economy well. Uh, and I agree with uh, my co-panelists who talked about the economy is central to the campaign that is coming. The economy always is the centerpiece of all political campaigns. And the point we're making is that because they failed to manage the economy, which is mad, actually, Benjamin, the Achilles heel of the NDC, managing the economy is always a challenge for the NDC. Okay. <laughs> this and is... any time they are in government, just quite one second, any time they are in government, the economy of Ghana underperforms. The economy of Ghana, wherever they pick it from, deteriorates. That record is established, and you can look at it. Okay. And the final thing I want to say is that um, there's a point I want to make, which, of course, would be uh, uh, very uh, tricky for my position in our internal elections, which I would, I would try not to make. But I just want to make a simple point that you see in Musa Dabwe's research all along that his colors are showing. I like the point that was made by my co-panelist. I think, uh, uh, if I, may, I, I mispronounce the name, please let me... Let, uh, Tutu Bwahini. Tutu Bwahini. Thank you very much is that you cannot sit where uh, Musa Dankwa is sitting to predict 53 or whatever number you want to throw out. That only shows your bias. That only tells people that you go into this research with estimated number of outcomes that you already want. Because uh, with a scientific uh, process, you cannot. Okay. You cannot. And Thank, you. Thank you, Richard. So Thank you, Richard Ahiakba. The only thing I'll say there is that the 52 or 53 percent was actually based on the survey that he conducted. It wasn't off the cuff. He actually took it from the survey that was conducted. Did I get that right? Correct. In fact, in the survey, he had even higher number of 55 percent. So I'm assuming that the, the poll number will close. When it does close, it, we expect him to be within that range. So, Thank you very much. Uh, you just heard Richard Ahiamba, uh, Director of Communications with the MPP, and uh, also Musa Dankwa, Executive Director, Global Info Analytics. Then there was Dr. Tutu Bwahin, Political Marketing Consultant with the University of Education, whatever, and Joyce Bawa Mokhtari, Special Aid to John Dramani Mahama. With these conversations, there will always be positions taken and opinions that are that don't rub off well on other people. But I guess, come election 2024, the chips will fall in their proper places. Thank you for uh, watching this engagement, but we still have a lot more coming your way. Planting for food and jobs. Since 2017, it's been on the roll. We've spent a lot on it. We've invested a lot into that uh, program. But what have been the yields? Has it lived up to expectation? Well. We'll be hearing from major stakeholders on that all-important matter after the break. Do stay.
Very good morning to you. Thank you so much for staying here on the AM show. It's now time to bring you that conversation on uh, our latest conversation. And government in 2017 introduced the flagship program, Planting for Food and Jobs, to modernize activities of smallholder farmers. This was to lead to an increase in food production, create jobs, and provide raw materials for agro-based industries. Well, uh, since its introduction, there has been an increase in the prices of fertilizer and other inputs. And this has quadrupled food prices from markets and other avenues. So here's what the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana is doing. It's been assessing the Planting for Food and Jobs program and uh, they'll be joining us to share portions of a yet to be released report and we, we will be joined by Charles Nyaba, Executive Director, Peasant Farmers Association. Good morning to you Mr Nyaba, thank you for joining the program. Good morning and let me say good morning to your listeners and your team. Well, we appreciate uh, your time this morning. So tell us exactly uh, what you've been doing in your assessment of the Planting for Food and Jobs program. We've had um, occasions where we've engaged you, but just tell us the modalities in this particular assessment. Okay, thanks so much. So uh, as you said uh, from uh, your introductory, um, the Planting for Food and Jobs was actually established to modernize the activities of smallholder families. The aim was to increase their productivity ensure that we have enough food to consume and also for industry and to create jobs. So we have been following events from the implementation since this inception and several issues are coming up from our members about poor implementation, poor quality of input supply on the planting for food and jobs and then high prices of inputs on the planting for food and jobs. So we decided to actually carry out a survey of uh, our members across the entire country to farm out uh, their perception about the 2022 implementation. We did that because after the former uh, Agri Minister resigned to contest the presidency, we, we thought that it was an opportunity to discuss with the incoming minister to share farmers' experience to help him redesign the implementation. So we've done that. We had our first engagement in northern part of the country in Tamale, where stakeholders ranging from farmers, uh, fertilizers, uh, dealers, seed dealers, mechanization service providers, extension officers, all met. And then we deliberated over the issues. And a lot of interesting issues are coming up. So we are doing a similar one in Accra tomorrow, where we are bringing similar stakeholders, including the ministry itself, to share some of this finding to see whether that can inform the new modalities that the new minister wants to introduce. Mm, so this is in anticipation that that minister would even want to make any changes. Have you gotten any form of assurance or hint that that is going to happen? Yeah, so um, contrary to the previous minister who did not believe in the consultation, I think we've already been consulted on two occasions on uh, what he intend to do, which uh, we think is good to consult because if you consult and then you fail, you fail with the people. So we thought that just consulting with the executive alone is not enough. So we are now taking the, 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 the efforts to now consult broader membership and broader stakeholders to provide him with the findings. And uh, I think uh, he's just about uh, uh, finalizing the, the new modalities. Mm. He's aware of what is going to take place tomorrow. And uh, I'm sure provisions will be made for the recommendations to be considered. Kindly share with us, you say you've done this in the northern part of the country. Kindly share with us what the findings were. What did the farmers complain about? Yeah, so we looked at the various areas and the major areas of farmers' concern, which uh, actually influence the food prices we are currently experiencing in the market, are the prices of uh, fertilizer and seeds for 2022 and then quality of PFDA inputs that were supplied. So if you take price, for instance, uh, we're trying to find out uh, farmers' perception about the prices. Did they think that the PFDA prices were okay? And then the two percent said the prices were extremely high and that they could not uh, afford. Uh, so, and they tried to compare the price of 2021 to 2022. According to them, if you buy 
50 kg fertilizer for 2021. It was going for 96 Ghana cities. The same uh, 50 kg of the MPK fertilizer increased to 320 Ghana cities in 2022. The PFJ fertilizer. That is about a 233% increase in prices. When you also take um, the, the, um, the, the quality, which was their major concern, majority, about 80% said the PFJ uh, seeds and fertilizer was of poor quality. Only 15% uh, said the, the quality was okay. And then if you also take timely delivery, about 50% said they received the fertilizer uh, at the time that it is not needed. So these were some of the issues that actually came up. And what is the effect of all these things in their productivity? We tried to look at that and then we have over 80% of them said that they have to reduce fertilizer application. We have another over 80% saying that they have to switch from uh, producing crops like maize and rice to producing other crops like soy beans and cashew nuts that do not require too much fertilizer. So you can see that that has also translated into supply of maize in the market. So because of high cost of uh, maize due to low supply, we also have uh, over 70% of poultry farmers scaling down their productivity. And even the 30% left, upon talking to them, they said they have to also uh, reduce their, their, their farm sizes to half. So that's why when you go to the market today, in some markets, you may not even get maize to buy in other areas and the price mm. will be expensive. Mm. When we come to tomatoes, most of the tomatoes farmers said they did not actually receive any support from, from the PAP. So um, they have to quit from the uh, tomatoes production. So now we have to depend on Burkina Faso for tomatoes. There are issues that are also emanating from a Burkina Faso, which has to do with Bukun Haram and other things. So our market women are not able to go there to bring tomatoes. The reason why when you go to a market today, you will buy two fruits of tomatoes for about five cities, you know. So for all this, and we think that as uh, citizens who are producers at the same time, consumers, we should be concerned and we should help government to succeed to ensure that we have enough food in the markets for all of us. Mm, so tell us more about tomorrow's program. Um, who will be in attendance? Is it going to be online, uh, interested persons? Um, how do interested persons access the program? Yeah, so tomorrow's program, we are actually bringing in all the actors in the agriculture value chain. Uh, the Ministry of Food and Agri itself will be there. We have uh, CSIR will be there, PPISD, who are in charge of uh, quality control of fertilizer and seeds, will be participating. We have the fertilizer importers and then retailers. And then we have farmers representative from all the regions who will be coming to also share their experiences. Um, the media, like yourself, we expect you to be there because uh, we would like the discussion to go far for our farmers who are in the rural areas to know what is happening. Uh, we've also engaged parliament. Uh, we are hoping that they will be part. Uh, we are bringing parliament because uh, in 2021, um, there was a, a, a law that passed restricting the export of some of the commodities. After that law was passed, uh, like soya beans, it was to create enough soya beans for our local processors to be able to process, process enough to feed the poultry industry. As we speak, the local processors are not buying. Uh, soya farmers are stuck with their soya grains. They can't sell to produce again. So we think that we need to bring parliament into the picture to also look at issues surrounding uh, that area. So um, I think uh, we are bringing almost all the actors in the agri value chain, and uh, we expect uh, those that uh, we left out uh, who will be willing to listen to this interesting conversation to also join. And Charles Nyaba is executive director of the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana, and he was just giving us some information about uh, the association's uh, assessment of the planting for food and jobs program and its contribution to our development and uh, one of the takeaways is that uh, the association believes that the new minister is more welcoming uh, in terms of their input in the particular program and so it's one of the reasons why this assessment is happening so that they can share information with him and uh, improve the program away from that um,
Only five miners out of suspected 30 who were trapped under an illegal mining pit that caved in on Monday at Kualete in the Brim North District of the Eastern Region have been rescued alive. Seven of them died. Uh, locals are still frantically trying to um, use all means possible to rescue the others. Let's get um, more on this from the District Chief Executive for Ibrim, Raymond Nana Damte. Mr. Damte, thank you so much for speaking to us. Sadly, uh, we have to speak on, uh, on, on a rather unfortunate incident that occurred. But briefly tell us what the case count is as at now. How many people have been rescued and how many people have unfortunately lost their lives? Okay, good morning. Uh... I was listening to you, and I don't know how did you come out with the fight to rescue. You see, sometimes when the incident happens, the media house and you guys need to help us a little bit before you send out in the information. Mm. So, yes. so this information, I mean, because you asked, I'll just let you know. This information was given to our sister station, Adum News, uh, by one of the people who was trying to help uh, um, the, the rescue effort. And that's why okay. I wanted you to confirm the case count as of now, because with rescue efforts, we know that as time goes on, the figures may change. And that's why I'm just asking you for an update. Yes, I'm going to give you an update, but the, the point I'm trying to make and clear the way with the media guys, even yesterday, I spoke with, you just mentioned Adam, so I have to go straight and tell you. I spoke with Adam, Adam people called me, the news editor, and I was telling him that he had to wait because we don't have accurate numbers and information. And what he told me that when they come to news, they don't wait, they need to go ahead and report whatever they have. I said, okay, that's why you do your work. That is bad. But anyway, uh, the incident occurred yesterday. I got to know around 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. I have to call the police commander and my DNI officer. And my district, the pol uh, political district, that, the, where the incident happened is my jurisdiction. Okay. But when it comes to police administration, it's in Cocoa Division. Because Brim North has two divisions at the police administration, in Cocoa and Oda. So about uh, half of my district fall out into Oda, and half of them fall out in Koko. So where the incident occurred yesterday is in Koko jurisdiction. So I have to call the Koko commander. We all went to the scene. We left there around 9 p.m. or thereabout. The whole issue is seven confirmed dead, dead. And they said there was 10 of them underneath over there. They rescued three and seven dead. Hello, Mr. Dante. Hello? Ha Sorry, Mr. Dante, your line uh, went dead for a few seconds. So uh, can you start off the point where you said that they, you, you were told there were 10, seven have been rescued, and uh, three have been rescued, I beg your pardon, and seven have been confirmed dead? Yes. That is what I was, uh, I was saying. The seven confirmed dead and right. the three was rescued. Right. But I need to make it clear, those three was rescued, they said. We didn't saw them yesterday over there. When we got there, they said they have already rescued those three and sent them to the hospital. Remaining seven, they, we managed to take them from the, uh, the pit, which all of them were dead, and they said they are, there were 10 over there. So if we are taking their word, as a final uh, statement of 10 of them, seven, I can confirm that we took that seven to the mob yesterday. But the three, they say they rescued them. We didn't see them at all yesterday. Okay, but did you confirm which hospital they were taken to? When we asked them, they mentioned that they sent them to the hospital. The incident occurred yesterday, 9 a.m., not the evening. Okay. 9 a.m. So when the incident happened 9 a.m., right after they managed to take the three, they, told, they, they found out that those three are their one, they, they, they thought they are alive. They took them to the hospital. And the seven of them, they started working on it to take them out there. So when they become tired and the news started coming out, so we all we have to go over there and help them to take those people out. So who are the they you refer to here? The they who rescued what, what, and uh, what? retrieved the bodies? Oh, what do you say? I'm saying, you keep saying they tried to rescue, they brought them out. And I'm saying, who are the they here? 
No, when, uh, they use uh, the indigents over there okay. and the other people, they are working with them on the Galamseyas. So they didn't they inform the police at all until not, you got wind yes, of it? they didn't inform the police from 9 a.m. until we got to know around 5 p.m. Mm. Were you aware that Galamse activities were happening in, in that the, part? The, the, the only time I'm aware was yesterday when I had an incident happen and went to the sea where I didn't know there was a Galamse activity that was going on since they started. And I don't know when they started the Galamse activities over there, but they were doing the Galamse over there where the incident happened yesterday. Mm, and, and the police is also not aware that these Galamseers are there? Well, as far as I'm concerned, I can say yes, but how did I confirm that? Mm. But, but I, I'm not out. Right, sorry, Mr. And, and as I said, as I said earlier, that part over there fall in Coco uh, Police Administration. Yes. So anything happening over there, they report to the Coco. Mm. Right. So maybe when when the Coco Police, uh, Equity Police, which under in Coco. They find out they have to call their, their uh, commanders in Nkoko. Then somebody has called me. Then I have to call my commander. And he said he just uh, get it. So he's calling his colleague. Then quickly, I called the Nkoko commander. He said, yes, chief. That is what happened. We just put it. So we are preparing to go over there. So, okay, let's meet together. And go, uh, let's meet and go over there together. Right. So what, what, what were you told? What exactly happened? Where? Hello? Come back again, your question. Yeah, Mr. Damti, I'm asking, what were you told? Since you didn't witness this yourself, what did they tell you? What led to the, the collapse of the pit? Well, even, even for me to hear that there's a uh, mining, uh, Galamse, people trapped over there, I had a call from Adam. Adam TV called me. While I was in the office, around 5 o'clock. The media people called me and said, no, it can't happen in my district, and you have to call me from my trap. Anyway, I'm not going to doubt about that. Let me call my police commander. And that's the time I find out. And they said they were doing the illegal activities, which, of course, yes. When I went over there, I saw they were doing the illegal activities. And the whole uh, part of the mountain collapsed on them. It's, they are working under the mountain. And they collapsed on them. It was illegal activities they are doing. Okay, so I'm just saying what led to the collapse and, and just help us understand. I, I, can't, I can't tell you what led to the collapse okay. because I was not there. I, I appreciate that, but when you got there, you were given some information, and I'm only asking if you were told the. You see, what led to the death uh, the was they do the illegal activities and the collapse was on them. Okay. What led to for collapse, I can't tell. Right. I can't say they, where they, they, they did the blasting or whatever. I can't tell what led to collapse. That's but okay. What I do know is. They do the illegal mining and uh, how do they part of the mining they are working and they need collapse on them. All right, Mr. Damte. Um, so where was this happening? In the forest or in the community? Just give us a picture of where the illegal mining was happening. It, it's, uh, it's actually, it's not a forest, but it's a mountain leading to the forest. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so right after that mountain, then it hit on the forest, and that forest it, uh, it's a big forest, it went straight to our forest. Okay, so pe do people live around there, or it's quite a secluded area? No, no, it's a secluded area. People, it, it's in when we, uh, where the car can go over there and we park. We walk about an hour and a half or almost two hours before we go over there. People don't live there, but they, 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 are, they have that bush over there doing that illegal activity. Mm. Um, and I'm asking this because, you know, the conversation on illegal mining has been going on for years now. And yes. I'm, I'm just wondering if, um, as DCE, there was any auditing done, like going through the community to see if there were people who were mining illegally. Did you see some people in different areas or you have never it, witnessed it, it, illegal it, it, mining it, it, happening we, we, in your area do, at all? We do go into the community, but we cannot walk in this. All the forests or all the bushes. And in this district, say, I'm going to search for Galamse people to you know. Right. Unless somebody have to call you. Mm. It's not like I'm going to wake up in the morning and say, okay, let me go and do the auditing on Galamse and walk into the forest and see people do their mind over at Galamse. No. Unless you had the information. We didn't get any information. People, the place you get information that people doing the Galamse over there, we strike on them. Some of them with arrest, and even as I'm talking to you now, some of them even is in court, doing back and forth. All okay. what you need to do. To uh, crack down Galamse, we are doing unless you had information. Wow. And you know, these people, when they're doing it, it's hard 
for them to give you the uh, hard equal information. Even yesterday, uh, incident happened 9 a.m. Imagine, we got to know around 5 p.m. thereabouts. We got to know around 5 p.m. because mm. they try to hide by themselves. So what's the next uh, move from you, uh, Mr. Damte? Uh, what, is, what is your next activity? What are the next line of actions? After the, next, the next line of action is, since we find out that that place, they're doing the illegal activities over there. As I told you, another media house, you cannot sit there 24-7. But you have to do the monitoring back and forth over there. And also today, the team went over there to do the mop-up and see if there is any more or something else we need to talk about it. So the police and the fire service people, they are there now. They are watching over there. So all what we are going to do next is we need to make sure that we are going to monitor over there that place and make sure that that activity is not going to carry on. But Mr. 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 Damte, if you say that the people said there were 10, 7 dead, 3 rescued, the number has been accounted for. Why is the fire service and police still there? You see, we left there 9 o'clock in the night. Okay. And we have to go to the incident scene. As a security officer or when the incident happened, you can't say that we were over there yesterday, so that's it. No, we need to go to the incident scene. We can get some report or what. You are asking me what led to the collapse, right? Yes. So if we didn't go over there back or do some, some map up, or, we can't get the full details. It's not like we left yesterday over there, so that's it. No, we can't do that. We have to go back at, again. I appreciate it. Mm. All right. Thank you so much. I just wanted to, to clarify if they were continuing with efforts, if there were any people still believed to be there. But you say that they are there gathering information as part of investigations. Of course, we have to. We have to. Thank you for we your time. To. Thank you for your you. time this morning. And uh, we'll stay in touch. Raymond Nana Damte is DCE for Ibrim. And he was just giving us some um, official information on a, the a collapse of a mining pit which has led to the killing of seven persons uh, we're told that three people have been rescued so far he's not able to tell us where they they were sent to or where they are currently uh, because according to him um, the the youth of the area did the rescue before he was informed later by sister station adum news we'll be following this uh, issue keenly obviously feeding into the bigger conversation on illegal mining and it's attendant challenges you're watching the am show with me bernice abu bedulan so we'll be back with more do stay Thank you for staying on the AM show and guess who is back, Benjamin Akako. How are you? It's quite a morning. Uh, I'm very well. Mm -hmm. What can we At do? At least it's not we'll take it rainy. Day by day. It's cool this morning in Accra, but it's not as rainy as yesterday. My light was off for the larger part of yesterday, so it was good that the rains had come so it was, because yeah. they sort of compensated. Cooled. Sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. I had issues making electronic payments yesterday and I, I kept asking myself when would the story change does it always have to be like that when it rains so heavily well internet connectivity and many things are impacted when it rains in this country so that's that is a short point but especially on the back of since you started talking about the rains mm. um, yesterday on a platform i am on the conversation was about how much it would cost to stem the tide of flooding especially in accra versus how much we likely could spend in terms of loss of life, loss of property, and the myriad challenges we face on the back of the perennial flooding problem we have. Uh, I think it was Professor Patrick Ferkoyen, you remember the Global Climate Adaptation Group, and that research they put together, looking at the gains and losses of same, and... I don't know. I really don't know. The flooding situation in Ghana, in Accra specifically. I can't get my head around it. So it's, um, it's quite a complex thing. 
Because while we are trying to solve it, there are still people today building in waterways. So you're trying to solve With whose permission? Exactly. That's what I'm saying. It's quite complex. Um, Johnson is our first scholar. Hello, Johnson. Oh, too bad we lost Johnson there. So Benjamin, you see, um, it's, it's like the question I posed to uh, the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources when mm. he first launched the Green Ghana campaign. And I asked him, you're spending so much to Green Ghana while there are people in forests, people um, illegally cutting down trees, for mining, We're people decimating are decimating our forests. Exactly, and so it's, it's counterproductive. What are you doing while you are launching a campaign to Green Ghana to stop that? Because then it comes down to zero then, because what's the point? It's like fetching water in a basket, isn't it? And then he said, oh yeah, we're going to do this, and we're going to do that, and we're going to do this. But like we just heard, the people who are still mining. He, this one said, that the, the, the GC I just spoke to in a brim says that where these miners were mining is en route the Etiwa forest. Mm. If they're getting closer, who knows? So, I mean, Benjamin, again, it's a complex issue. It's a complex issue. But I think that but why when we have the complex, will, Bernice, if exactly we have the, the point will, I was about to make. Politically, if our leaders have the will, we can do it. We have and, political and, pretense. That's what we have. And it's one of the things that makes me still confident that a lot of things can change in Ghana if we find that one person who is willing to make the difference. Who is willing to make the difference. I don't know who that person will be, um, and I don't know when that person will come, but I'll keep hope alive while I'm still here. Well, we cannot give up hope. We have a call on the line. Hello, good morning. Good Hello, morning. Johnson. Hello. Good morning to yes. you. Good How morning. Are you? Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Right. I'm happy to um, watch join you every morning. Thank and you. what I want to contribute is that um, the NDC elections um, should be a wake-up call for MPP. Mm. That they should do a lot of homework in their party. In Ghana, we need peace so that we can develop our country. The politics is the center of all development. And I believe that we need to choose a very good leader. And I foresee changes in the four elections to be Northerner versus Northerner. And that is when Amega Shia Amega, Ehonebehu Amega Hoho. But in all this, Ghanaians should see that your mama has still Northerner. In the sense that he's not been able to put up any legacy in the North. Eight years, Vice President and President. Kufo came in 2008 and gave a modern stadium. Nana Kufuado came and gave the people of Tamale, the northern city of Ghana, an overhead of calling it again. And I think John Mama should have talked about his people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Johnson, for sharing your thoughts with us. And uh, so Johnson has gone ahead of all of us to predict He's already Baumia as flag bearer of the NPP. We'll see mm. how it goes. Um, but then again, there's something we do in this country that I don't know. I just, I don't know what you think about it, but this um, colorization in terms of where you come from when it comes to politics. So, oh, Ben is Fanti, Benjamin is ever. And you know how it even goes in determining who should be um, running mate and all the dynamics. Well, we have another caller from Tamale this morning, Abdallah. Good morning. Let's hear you. Yes. Uh... Okay, my 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 uh, my word is about Ghana. We are talking about Ghana. Right. Let's look the whole uh, issue based on people who have vision, but okay. not people who think of their self, their family, and other things. Right. We've experienced the, the the rule of Kwame Nkrumah. In fact, there were no graduates like. In, in criminal government, like the graduates that we are having in our system, and nothing is going. So let's look at people who are visionary. We'll try people who have tried, and then we'll see what they have done. And also, it's not about uh, talking, 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 talking. The talking doesn't have any, anything in Ghana. Mm. When I'm, 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 I'm referring to uh, the two leaders, Nanado, and then John Dramani Mahamud. Right. 
Which of them bring infrastructure? Infrastructure brings development and employment. All what he started is, I was expecting Nanado to continue that project. When completed, you can see, even one secondary school, how many people will be, employed, will be taken there? Mm. How many children will get access to education? And all of these things. But unfortunately, I don't know whether personal issues or whatever, just abandon all these developmental projects, and then he, he started doing different things, which we are not seeing. So I'm not a politician, and I will never do politics. But comparing these two people, I think when we bring John Drama and Muhammad back, it will help us a lot, if only he still have that vision. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us as well. So Benjamin, another caller concerned about infrastructure, development, continuation of projects. Um, and it's, it's something we've had you know, reason to complain about um, every time one government hands over to the other in terms of political parties you know, moving from their usual eight years to a different one and how projects are stalled and, mm. and all those kind of things. That is also because we don't have a proper rollover. You're right. And everybody wants to... We don't have the right structures for the role. And, and so everybody's thinking about me, 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 instead of Ghana, Ghana, Ghana. Mm. So if Benjamin started and I complete it and it benefits Ghana, it's about... It's, it's, it's about... It's about... Interchange it's about... Rug and rights. Riding. You know, exactly. I, I want to have the, the pride of saying, I did it. But what's the point in even what Benjamin started if mm. it will help us, all of us? Mm. Louise is calling us from Accra. Hello, how are you? Let's hear you, please. I'm fine. Hello? Louise, can you please reduce the volume of your TV set and listen to me over the phone, please? Hello, Louise, if you can hear me now, please go ahead with your submission. How are you? We are doing well, thanks for asking. Please go ahead with your submission. Uh, yes, your program is very educative. It is it, very educative. That is why I'm listening to you people talk. In fact, uh, you are going to build, if you continue like this, you are going to build uh, Ghana for all of us. I myself have seen a lot of uh, things that uh, we want more money and we are spoiling all our uh, uh, rivers and everything. And we are not thinking about our future children that uh, we are going to put into this Ghana nowadays and it, it, it is very appalling and I'm also adding my contribution. If they can even stop the balance fee, they should restructure our mining all. They should just stop it. We can stop it. If we are a nation and we are living in the community. So if they are living in the community, and then uh, we just sit down and these small boys, because of small pin nut, this thing, and it, it, it was well as a bit. Mm. This is what I'm also making my contribution. In any government that comes, you even take that one as a priority. Right, Louise. Uh, Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. We appreciate it. So, Benjamin. I don't know whether that's not the first time we're hearing from. Lewis, I, I, I think from my is. end, I think yes, I think it, it is. is. So thank you, thank you so thank much you for, for calling. calling. We hope to hear from you more. All right, and and Benjamin, he talks about these galamseas earning peanuts, and I know people will be sitting there and saying, no, you don't know what they earn. They earn so much, but comparing that to the loss of lives, like we've just seen, yeah, comparing that to the, the destruction of our water bodies, comparing that to our food having traces of chemicals, comparing that to children being born with deformities, comparing that to people losing vital organs because they've been poisoned one way or the other. Indeed, it is peanuts. I don't, I don't care if you earn a million CDs, but you cannot equate that to all the negative impacts of illegal mining. Factor that into if some of our leaders themselves are complicit. Hmm. Makes it even worse. We have Stephen on the line. Is it from Winchy? Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What are your thoughts for us? Yeah, I just want to make a contribution towards the um, uh, illegal mining money. Please go ahead. 
Okay, go cool. Um, my question is, uh, um, is there any one of you have been staying in mining area before? <laughs> is that is that question? Is that a question to us? Yeah, yes. I just want to. I just want to make a contribution. Yeah, please go ahead. We are listening. Okay, what I'm trying to say is that when you come to money area, we have university degrees. Those who are having masters, they are not having job. Yeah. So when they complete school and they don't get job, they go to money area and work. And let me tell you, no president on this earth can stop guarantee. We have about four million people jobless, and they depend solely on guarantee. So my advice to presidents or the head of state in this country is that you have to regularize and make some policies because if they touch guarantee money, that president will lose. Are you? A, uh, can I ask you a question? Are you? Yeah, are you a galam? Are you a galam sayer yourself? I'm not a galam sayer. I'm are, not, you I'm not a in, are you involved? But I'm living in a galam community. I was just about to ask. So okay. I know what I'm talking about. All right. So for you, um, it's about regularizing illegal yeah. mining. Yeah. But 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 you would agree that that was in the often, right, Benjamin? I mean, you can remind me. At the time, small, all forms of small-scale mining and illegal mining was banned. There was a roadmap. And so all small-scale miners, even those who were doing it leg legally and galamsias, were asked to stop working so that government will regularize. And they even introduced a community mining scheme. There's a grant plan. But it appears those who are involved in illegal mining do not want to buy into governments agenda and government's plan and so they continue to um, do galam say they continue to mine in our river bodies in fact mining in river bodies is actually a, that one you cannot even regularize it that is not allowed even 500 meters is it close to a water yeah. body there is there are laws surrounding community and small scale mining so the thing here is nobody has been stopped from mining legally it is those who are doing it illegally that we are all coming for those who are not adhering to the the rules in the book and and Bernice, if i may add like you mentioned okay. when when that ban uh was we're grateful for your thoughts sir when when that ban was in force what did we see we saw some reparation so to speak and we should ask ourselves what are the small scale miners doing now because the small-scale mining has been with us for a long time. Right. What were our forebears doing well? I think it was, I've forgotten which one of us, uh, whether it was Samuel Kojobres who said that he had a relative who had done this in the past or something of the sort, way back in time. They did it with a certain conscience. So we weren't seeing the sort of devastation we're seeing on our environment now. Obviously, if there's an uptick and things are going awry, I, I sincerely dispute what he says about the fact that no president can put a, a stop to Galamsey. Yes, it can be done. It just needs the required um, will and, of course, the required action to follow that will. So I, I do not see where he's coming from that this cannot be done. I understand the point about employment and unemployment, okay? And the fact that of the one million or so people involved, they take care of a number of people. You have over four million people dependent on Galamsey. But if it is not done right, and the consequences are going to be what we are seeing on our environment, would we still say we should just go ahead till the entire country is destroyed? Absolutely. I, I don't get that. And so for anybody who is interested in small-scale mining, there are processes to go through, okay? So I'm not sure the conversation is that we should stop mining altogether. No. It's been no. done since time. We've before. said that we should mine responsibly and we should stick to the rules in the book. Even if you have a license as a small-scale miner, you shouldn't go near our water bodies because then you are using your license to perpetrate an illegality. Well, um, let's go to Kaneshi. Our last caller is joining us from there. Hello. Hello. Hi, great to have you here. Your name again? Sorry, I missed it. Kwame. Kwame, great to have you. Let's hear what you have to share. Um, thank you very much. Um, you guys are doing very well. Thank um, you. I just want to comment a, a bit about ex-president's decision, and I don't know if that's allowed. You would like to congratulate him? 
comment a little about that. My okay. issue, uh, something worries me a little bit, that's why. Why, please go ahead. Okay, good. Um, you know, normally when we are as people, and maybe those of you in the media space, we, we sometimes appear to be looking too much at the government rather than the alternative. Because if he's saying certain things up, sometimes I sit back and it worries me a bit. Like, for instance, they promised to restore licenses of defined banks. I thought that is Bank of Ghana's issue. So in that circumstance, are we not undermining those institutions? Another time I heard him say that oh, he will release galamseers who have illegally been. They have gone through a system. So is it not undermining those things? Are they not going to undermine uh, those bodies if he gets into the presidency? So probably my suggestion is that when somebody wants to come into government, the thing they say, we may have to scrutinize this as much as we are scrutinizing the performance of the certain work. Because we are bringing that same system, another system which is making promises that probably may not be proper. If we have done that in the past, maybe some of the things this current government said, we may have scrutinized and realized that no, this guy don't say this. But they will say things, get power. And then they will realize that they are not doable. And then we have, to, we become the victims. So my plea is that as people, including you media, when they, uh, uh, as aspirants, make promises or say something, let's situate it in the rules and say, is he saying the right thing? Is this, is this something we want it to happen? That are we going to are we expecting our president to be restoring licenses of banks who have gone through a system or release people who have been sentenced through a system of galamsey or something? That's that's something that worries mm. men. Right, Kwame. Keep coming up. It's keep coming worrying. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us, Kwame. And Kwame ends um, our interactive, uh, interactive segment with you. And uh, he's concerned about certain utterances made yeah. by former President John Dramani Mahama. Um, and I'm sure the politicians will hear. And once again, uh, Benjamin. We keep reminding them to be when, careful, wary of what they say, because you see, we're going to hold them against them. Remember what Dr. Baumia said previously about going to the IMF and all those things. And, and now schools under trees. Mm. Well, that's how we enter this, today's edition of <laughs> the AM. Let me just sneak in mm. again, belated birthday wishes to Rita Adam Dugba. Yesterday was your birthday. God bless and keep you. Right, our time is up. It's now time to say goodbye to you. But you know, this is your most credible news source joining us. We've got more for you. Up next is News Desk to Stay. But from Benjamin and I, it's goodbye. See Peace you again out. tomorrow. Take care.